Regeneration uh, Committee uh, this morning. Welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you're well and it's uh, nice to see you on screen and hopefully at some point we can see each other in a in a room uh, too. So I hope you're well. Um, so can I have a, a note of any um, apologies and substitutes please, Leslie? Convener, I'll provide the, the details oh, of apologies you, and, and the substitutes if that's okay. So we've got a number of apologies this morning. We've got apologies from Councillor Beveridge, Cameron, Michael Coyle, Councillor Fisher, Councillor Kerr, Councillor McGregor, Councillor McLaren, Councillor McNally and Councillor Stokes. Um, we've got substitute uh, no, pre-notification of substitutes in terms of standing order 64A. Councillor McCulloch will be attending for Councillor Fisher, Councillor Castles for Councillor McNally. Councillor Stubbs will be attending for Councillor McGregor. Uh, Councillor T. Johnson will be uh, attending for Councillor M. Coyle. And Councillor McGowan will be um, substituting for Councillor Stubb, uh, Stock, sorry. Um, and also uh, Councillor Morgan is an apology as well, convener. Can I put an apology for Councillor Curry, please? And there will be no substitute. Thank you very much for that, uh, that update. Can we move on now to uh, declarations of interest in terms of ethical standards and public life, etc. Scotland Act 2000? Lily Goldie, you've given a notification. Thanks, Convener. Uh, declaring interest in Agenda Item 9, uh, I'm a member of the Sanctuary Scotland Central and West Area Committees. Thanks very much, Lily. Uh, Councillor Douglas. Can I declare item number six? Uh, I know some of the parties involved and through that as well. I'm not sure about item number nine because it does make reference to that A uh, to number six uh, as part of the ship. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'll need to leave for number nine, but certainly if I can leave for number six, I'll leave it for the opinion of the experts. Uh, thanks very much. And as we approach to that and we get to the report, I'm sure Mark can direct you into the lobby should it be required. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed there was a couple of typos in the reports that we received. I will pick them up at the reports where they uh, are where they're connected to make sure that we are connecting to the appropriate recommendations as we go along. Uh, so apologies of the uh, administration for that um, for those. So we will move on to the homeless performance uh, and processes uh, report that's on page seven of your agenda. And Stephen, can we come to you please? Thanks very much, uh, convener. Uh, members, uh, the report in front of you in terms of homeless performance is highlighting the excellent performance of the full re uh, remat in relation to the full remat of housing and homeless services that were delivered across all our communities. Um, and I'm giving you some trends within that in terms of the health pandemic and kind of changes are, uh, that actually occurred at the time. A couple of things to highlight. I would highlight section 2.1 of the report where uh, is, uh, a homeless is threatened with, um, or a household, sorry, is threatened with homelessness uh, within two months. Um, if they're going to lose accommodation, uh, it still is two months, but just to make members aware that the government are currently, currently consulting on changing the two months to six months. And that's um, in respect of the changes that have happened in the last year where evictions, there was a temporary legis legislation brought in to stop evictions um, during the pandemic. That legislation has now been lifted. However, the government are consulting at the moment in changing the two month period to six months. So if a private landlord or the council or any other landlord, um, even the big banks want to try and evict someone, uh, they require now to have a six month period rather than the two month. So it's just to make members aware of that. Uh, a few areas of performance I'd like to highlight. We actually um, witnessed a 21% reduction in North Lanarkshire in terms of presentations for homelessness. And that's pretty much tied in with what I just said there in terms of this temporary legislation brought in to stop evictions. So it stopped people in the private sector being evicted uh, and it resulted in, in a significant decrease in terms of um, homeless presentations. Um, the average across Scotland was 9%, so you'll see in terms of the council, and you'll see in the report there's quite big variations in terms of a number of councils, but we, we witnessed a fifth reduction in comparison to the average across Scotland, 9%. Um, a couple other areas, the main reason for homelessness remains the same, 
you know, there's a, a drop in the percentage overall. The main re uh, reason for homelessness continues to be homeless relationship, uh, sorry, breakdown and disputes within the household. Also, to point out, the percentage led to homeless uh, remained pretty much the same, 39.25% against 40%. Um, so again, through the pandemic, pretty much the, the percentages staying as they are. Uh, we have a currently got about 640 dispersed homeless properties, emergency properties for people. Um, and during the pandemic, 118 households who were in them were allowed them to stay in there as secure accommodation. So it was a really good outcome for them. Um, sadly, domestic abuse remains. Um, and that was one area where we've seen an increase. Um, so there was an increase in domestic abuse during um, the pandemic, uh, and a, a fair part of that, we believe, in terms of doing analysis, is because people are, are longer in the house. But there was a two percent increase in the proportion of reasons why people became homeless during that time. And again, that's what we're doing with the partners to, to see what, what we can do to help support. I want to make it quite clear to members that at all points we make sure accommodation is available. A real positive in North Lanarkshire is we didn't breach the unacceptable accommodation order, and we haven't breached that in the last 15 years. You might have read in the newspapers, Glasgow and Edinburgh have thousands of breaches, and North Lanarkshire have none. There's no reason for anyone to sleep in the streets in North Lanarkshire. We have excellent accommodation available um, every single day. We have not used bed and breakfast for 15 years in North Lanarkshire either. Uh, and that's pretty much the highlights, and happy to take any any questions. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you for demonstrating and articulating the excellent practice uh, of this authority in dealing with some of our uh, most vulnerable uh, uh, people. Any questions? Uh, Bob Burgess, I see yourself is highlighted for a, a question. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, good morning, Stephen. Um, Stephen, uh, page 12, 2.7.3 uh, on the tower uh, strategy. Um, can I ask uh, how many goose raffle tenants in the, uh, that area uh, were rehoused in new build in Wisha? Uh, and just another one on top of that, is there some kind of report on the general effect that the emptying the towers is causing, uh, if it is, in the general uh, sort of house lending situation, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I can pick up the second one just now, uh, Councillor Burgess. Uh, in terms of the overall impact, the, the percentage of lets that we, we make to the reprovisioning list, uh, people who are, whether it's Gautrap or other areas across the council who are part of the first phase, there was 1,700 households um, identified in the first phase for demolition. It was over a five year period. Uh, accounts, if, uh, if you take into account people are actually, people sometimes get their, find their own accommodation, move away, and sadly people have actually um, been into nursing homes or died. So out of 1,750, um, there's 1,450 people we always kind of recognise we would require to house. Take that over the five years, it's just under 300 households a year, um, and we allocate 3,000 houses a year. So the actual percentage that goes to the reprovisioning list is about 10%. So 90% of the wider lets are still going to uh, people on the general list, people on the homeless list, people on the transfer list. So the overall impact to the reprovisioning it was done deliberately over a five-year period to make sure it wasn't having a negative impact on the wider kind of housing list. In terms of the people from Gouther Apple who have been housed in, I'm aware of a couple, but I would need to come back to you um, fully to tell you how many for the Gouther Apple area were housed in the Dimsdale area, but I'm happy to get that information for you. Uh, thanks very much. And just to encourage uh, members that if you have a specific question about a specific locality, you can do that out with uh, the committee. You don't need to bring that to committee if it's um, if you want to know that that information. It just gives the officers the opportunity to have that to hand uh, for you. I've got Councillor Castles next, please. Thanks, Chair. It's page eight, one point four. It's about the mandatory collaboration across the local authorities, health and social care, and the voluntary sector. Uh, maybe it's certainly one to ask us, but how do you see that? What would the process for that be? What do you see? In May, to say what would be the advantage to our authority if that was a mandatory collaboration, given the difficulties other authorities have maybe compared to ours or the, the progress we're making, just the process and what you would see could be some of the outcomes of that. Councillor so, Castles, we see the outcomes to be very, very positive. We have already were ahead of the game on this one. We have already started with uh, Previously brought uh, reports to committee. So in terms of rapid rehousing and the overall collaboration with with health, with social work, and with other agencies, the process has actually started. And I've got to say, the agencies have been excellent. 
Uh, they always have been to a certain extent, but sometimes <laughs> some are easier to get around the table than others. Um, but in this occasion, the stats over the years are actually quite alarming in terms of homelessness, in terms of the the percentage of homeless people who end up in A and E and the repeat offenders at A and E because of addiction and things. So that mandatory collaboration that has been brought in, I've got to say, North Lancashire are already we're already doing it in terms of the partners in North Lancashire, and we see the positive outcomes. It's all it's about changing the cycle of homelessness. It's about changing the cycle of people in addiction and things like that, and make sure they're supporting them. You all see in all your communities in terms of maybe some antisocial or whatever that are linked to the perception of people who can be homeless, but they've got really really serious and complex needs. And the fact I've got to say again within North Lanarkshire, although it's going to be mandatory, the government are going to be able to, it's already in place just now. We've set up a team, health are involved in that as well, as is social work, as are other agencies, and it's working really, really well. And we're piloting it with a, a, a number of just a small number of individuals just now and putting real um significant packages in there to support people. So it's already happening here. Uh, and I'd be happy to bring a, a report to, to, to members at a later date in terms of just what you're saying about the outcomes from that. But at the moment, it's very, very positive. Can, can I just ask a, a further question to you? Uh, just the, uh, that's excellent. Thanks, thanks for that. That's a really excellent point. We're really interested to see that as well. But just in another area, how do you see the mandatory collaboration across other local authorities? Would that be a all the local authorities are just local authorities of in contact with each other. Any progress being made and how that would be set up and what the aim of that would be, just the local authority one. It's a tough one that to answer just now because some local authorities are easier to deal with than others. And I'm sure local authorities might say that about ourselves as well. Um, we can all be a wee bit parochial at times. Uh, we've all got our own cases, whether it's in North Lanarkshire or whether it's across the individual um, housing areas in North Lanarkshire. Um, so we have got a reasonable relationship with a number of local authorities just now. Whether it's required to have this mandatory collaboration, local authorities are already in contact. But again, I would say it, 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 it differs depending on the local authority. And that's something we need to build that relationship up. Um, but I suppose we're all a wee bit nervous sometimes because when you're contacted about a case, you always wonder why. But there's always really, really good reasons why. Um, but it is a bit that we need to develop. The bit within North Lanarkshire is going really, really well. The wider bit you're asking is a bit that we definitely need to uh, make some progress on and develop better. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you very much, Councillor Valentine. Thanks, Chair. Uh... Page 9, bullet point 5 and 2.3, uh, additional properties were sought for use as temporary accommodation from other RSL partners. Uh, did we have any other, uh, any of the partners actually help us out with uh, temporary accommodation? The, the vast majority of temporary accommodation in the Council, Council of Valentine, is Council. Um, however, at, at that point in the pandemic and we were worried at the start that actually homelessness was going to go the other way around a 21% reduction. We were worried there was going to be a 21% increase, and it didn't turn out because of some of the temporary legislation. Um, two RSLs offered up accommodation, so just for the record, Sanctuary and Clyde Valley had offered up some accommodation at the time. There wasn't large numbers, um, but both of them, I think Sanctuary offered up two and Clyde Valley offered up four. Um, they weren't really in areas that we required the accommodation. Again, we look to see where the presentations are. So although sanctuaries and company all we had a sufficient supply. So it ended up although we were offered it, we didn't actually end up taking uh, taking the offer up but they weren't required. Okay, thanks. Councillor Stubbs. Thank you. Um firstly on the um collaboration between councils, uh, I, I wonder if, if we could hear a little bit what that would look like. I know um the, at the moment the any local authority only has the, the obligation to house somebody who is connected in some way, usually by the previous address or a previous address being within the local authority. Um, so, for instance, if somebody, somebody whose last address was in Glasgow presents at a um, Cobridge Housing Office, then there is no no obligation for, for North Lanarkshire Council to um, to take that on. Is that what they mean by the collaboration between councils? Um, and if so, that will be a, a very welcome move. Um, my second point is on. Sorry, I had it there, but when Alan was speaking, I moved it. Uh, sorry, Heather, let me just find the uh, point seven point two on page eleven. 
Um, the 118 temporary accommodation uh, residents that had the temporary accommodation flipped to secure tenancy. As welcome as that is, can um, Stephen, can you just give us an idea of what impact that's had on the temporary accommodation stock throughout the authority? And has, has that been replaced by other, other uh, properties, or are we just reducing the number? Thank you. Councillor Stubbs, no, it's, it's crucial when we go to flip a tenancy. We, we only flip a tenancy when we've got another tenancy to, to, get, to actually get. Um, and that's where we look at the whole portfolio of the council stock, the 36,500 houses. Um, I can't take, when I take one out, I've got to replace one. There sometimes can be a wee gap in that period in terms of doing the work to the property, but in terms of overall demand, although it dropped, you'll see in the report, although demand dropped, people have stayed in the temporary accommodation longer. So there's actually more people in temporary accommodation. And I know that can be sometimes difficult to get your head around that, but the people who were in it, because the legislation was in that nobody could be moved on. So there was actually less people coming through the door, but the people in it, instead of only staying for three months and get a permanent offer, a number of people were in it uh, longer. So it's key at all times when we're flipping that, try to get uh, good positive outcomes that we get one for one. So the pressure is always on the offices. If you want to flip a tenancy and come on and do that, which we receive requests all the time, rightly so, people are doing well. Um, but when they're flipping a tenancy, we've got to then find another one, another property in that vicinity. And in terms of the, the mandatory collaboration with other local authorities, you're dead right in terms of what you said. At the moment, it's if somebody presents in Coat Bridge, but their last uh, permanent property or address was in Glasgow. Um, North Lancashire Council can't take that homeless presentation. It's for Glasgow to make to take the homeless presentation. It's for Glasgow to do an investigation and make the decision. If the person wants to be housed in North Lancashire after the decision, then Glasgow contact the council to ask for a referral to be made. We have the right to say no in these circumstances, depending on where the person wants and what kind of demand. We've already got demands. The new um, legislation coming in will, will mean that if someone is found to be homeless by Glasgow, they can insist on being housed in North Lanarkshire. Um, there's a concern from some local authorities that some local authorities might. We've all got to get together and play the game together. But what we can't have is 200 people from Glasgow then suddenly decide I want to move to North Lanarkshire. But if that's what they so decide to do, then the, the legislation will permit that and allow that. So we don't know at the moment what impact that might have. I don't see it having a great impact just now. But until that comes in, we won't know how many people from North Lanarkshire, for instance, might want to go to Glasgow or West Lothian or vice versa. But the new legislation will permit that now to happen. Heather, can I just follow up? Yes, of course. Just to, just to clarify, with the new legislation, would, would the individual still have to go to Glasgow to present as homeless? Or, or would they be able to present in North Lanarkshire? We don't have a definitive uh, decision from the government on that just now. The, the one at the moment, it looks as if it's more like when they get the decision, then they can make the choice to move to North Lanarkshire and we must take it. But the actual initial bit of the presentation, we've asked for clarification on that just now. Um, I think it's reading as if they can, but we're not 100% sure. But I'm happy to come back and just put something out to members to advise the, um, the clarification. But we have asked for that just now. It's not clear just now. I'm sure that would be appreciated by by all members, Stephen, when we have that that information. Thank you uh, very much, colleagues. I've got no further uh, questions um, on this report. Can we note this report, please? Thank you very much. I'm seeing thumbs up and head nods. Sorry, I think you were passing over to me there. It's just your, your sound there was really, really uh, poor. I could hardly hear you. I don't know if it was just me or not. I'll put on my, my headset, um, but just I'll come to you for the Housing 2040 uh, report. Okay, thanks again, Convener. Um, in 2018, for members, the Scottish Government published a discussion paper setting out the context for housing to 2040 and highlighted the potential challenges, including child poverty, climate change, and an aging population. Many of these challenges in 2021 remain the same. However, again, though I keep going on about it today, the health pandemic obviously changed a number of different assumptions that were being made in terms of 2040. Um, at 1 1.4 of the report, um, it's laid out that everyone will have a safe, high quality home that is affordable and meets their needs. I think it's fair to say that North Lancashire have had that um, as their vision for a long number of years, and we are delivering on that, I would like to think, in terms of the new bills and everything else we're doing, the capital investment work. Um, at 2.1 of the report, you'll see the four priorities uh, to, to build more homes, 
to have affordability and choice, affordability warmth and zero emissions, uh, and to improve the quality of all homes. Um, the, the housing service and the council's overall vision and business plan has taken account of these areas. And I would like to think we are ahead of the plan in terms of where we're at. We are close to publishing the local housing strategy. We, we had reported to members in the last committee in terms of the progress of the local housing strategy, and we have taken into account what has been laid out in terms of um, the housing to 2040. So the report was really just to give members um, information in terms of the 20, 2040 report and the progress that North Lancashire Council and Housing Services is currently making. And again, happy to take any questions on that. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Councillor Cass. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, a, a few quick questions, Stephen. Just um, how will the refocusing of the town centres work in with the, the house building within the town centres as this progresses? Because, uh, the, obviously, the refocus in the town centres hasn't fully commenced yet. On um, page 17, what does self-provided housing mean? Um, on page 22, two areas. What is designated? What would be designated as unsustainable locations? What categories would cause a place to be designated as a, an unsustainable location? And uh, on the same page, just underneath that, if we're tightening up on use of green field sites, how will we designate what is a green field site so that planners can't apply for planning permission to build on that? And will that be within legislation, or will again will that be within the uh, with through a committee process. Thanks. Councillor Castles, I don't, I'm not sure if Pamela's on. I'm assuming Pamela is. She might be going to um, not be happy with me here, but a number of the questions in terms of the Greenbelt and stuff in the town centre is probably um, more appropriate for Pamela to answer. Um, Pamela, you, I can see your face now. Are you okay? So, in terms of the, um, the greenfield sites and uh, yeah, basically that that would be um, done through the, the local development plan, as um, members are, are probably aware. We're, we've just recently um, got the, the the report of examination back um, in terms of the uh, the most recent local development plan. So that would that's still to be uh, fully adopted, and we're just about really um, almost immediately to then start the process for the next uh, local development plan, and then that that obviously looks at. It's not so much um, greenfield; it's more, I think, in terms of uh, green belt uh, sites that um, where, where we try to restrict uh, development. But obviously, it, develop, it doesn't stop. You can't stop anybody putting in a plan and application for any site um, that they choose, and then, as you say, it's be through the um, through the planning committee uh, based on recommendations from officers to, to make uh, assessments on uh, any site that comes forward. So. Um, a greenfield site. It depends, you know, what the designation is. So it's it's not necessarily mean that it wouldn't be suitable for uh, some sort of development. And I'm sorry, Councillor Castles, I didn't catch the question about the the town centres. Could you maybe repeat that? How do, how do you view that as the the town centre plans move forward and the housing is progressing? How will the two combine so to say to work together so that both are working in the same process? Yeah, well, I think we're already. Um, I mean, that, I think that's happening already, both in terms of um, what we probably see later on, in terms of the ship, uh, the the sites that we're already identifying through the ship for um, town centre regeneration, and also how that links uh, with the the town centre visions and also the, um, the the planning process as well. So I think hopefully um, you will see that that is uh, you know been reasonably well coordinated in, in terms of how we. Uh, we get more residential housing, um, suitable residential housing into the, the town centres and help to reuse um, some of the buildings that are maybe no longer uh, suitable for retail or for um, offices or other purposes. So um, hopefully it, it will um, be relatively well coordinated. And the other two two questions were, one was on page 17, what is the definition of self-provided housing? And on page 22, what categories would deem an area un unsustainable for development? Sorry, I, I, I don't know what the um, unsuitable for development, Stephen, I don't know, I, I'm not familiar with that. Well, 
part I think we need to. Sorry. I think both. Of, sorry, Pam. I think both of them, the self-directed housing, uh, we're, we're happy to come back to members just with what the actual definitions are. Councillor Castles, apologies okay. for that. Thanks. I mean, think ultimately the, the report is about aligning um, the North Lanarkshire uh, ambition and housing quality with the aspirations of a uh, government uh, as well. So part of this program is um, is is new to uh, is all, and as the information is uh, evolving, our reports will follow timidly to committee as we as we progress. So we've got a number of uh, recommendations on page fifteen. Um, and can we uh, uh, note and agree those where it's appropriate to do so, colleagues? Thank you very much. Moving on to item four, we're coming to Stephen now for the Scottish Housing Regulator Report. Apologies, members, but you have me again. Um, the Scottish Housing Regulator Report is an annual report. Members will be aware that um, normally we actually are able to bring the report from the Scottish Housing Regulator. The Scottish Housing Regulator normally put out a summary document at this point that gives us some kind of information in terms of our performance in comparison to other um, councils. Um, that has not happened yet. And the deadline for the self the, the, the annual assurance statement is the end of October. So it falls in between committee. Had we waited to the next committee, we would have failed and it would have been a, a statutory breach by not signing the statement. So just to make that clear in terms of the reasons why the other report is not, the, the regulator has not um, actually published that yet. Um, one real bit to highlight in terms of what we went back to the regulator, there was one area where we had to report a statute to failure. That was in terms of one gas safety check. So out of 34 or 33 and a half thousand gas safety checks, one went over the 12 month anniversary date. However, that was a household who refused to allow that council access in. And the person was shielding. We did everything possible to to persuade them in terms of getting in as safely as possible, but they refused. We didn't want in these circumstances to go and do a forced entry, given the, cir the circumstances. Um, and when shielding was lifted in July last year, that um, service was carried out the first week in August, and the, the tenant was happy with that. So we've had to report that. My understanding from other councils are that um, significant numbers of uh, these actually went over the anniversary date, but the council had to report the one. Uh, so just to make members aware of that. Thank you very much, Stephen. I am a, a full report with some excellent examples of the key measures that we've uh, undertaken on an annual basis. Um, are there any questions uh, on this report? I'm not seeing anybody in the, the chat bar. Um, with that in mind, then, can we note and approve the contents of the report and the ratification of the signing of the annual assurance statement, uh, colleagues? Yes, thank you uh, very much. Uh, Councillor Lennon, as we move to item five, can I ask you to articulate your uh, declaration uh, of interest, please? Yes, Chair. My wife works for the service, so I will not take part in any debate. Thanks very much. Um, I'd seen it in the um, in the chat bar, but I know that the committee clerk always likes a reason uh, given uh, for the, the appropriateness uh, of the, the declaration. So moving on to item five, it's the tenant participation uh, strategy. I'm sure you'll agree, colleagues, it's, it's a full um, strategy document, some really interesting uh, work uh, within it. Stephen, can we come to you, please? Thanks very much again, convener. As convener said, the purpose of the report is really just to give uh, members and committee um, an update on the progress of the tenant participation strategy covering the period 20, uh, 20 to 2025. Um, as a really comprehensive report, you'll see at the back in terms of the appendix with the action plan, uh, very, very detailed. I think the onset, what I would like to say is the team have done an absolute fantastic job in the last 18 months under really, really difficult circumstances when the health pandemic um, started in March 2020. Um, the team kind of changed duties and actually started um, answering the calls in terms of the supporting people, um, organising food, dog walking, all sorts of stuff, or, or making deliveries to sheltered housing complexes for food. Um, so that team actually kind of changed their remit and they were an absolute joy. So they were. Um, nothing was a hassle for them at all. And they got out and right out into the community. So although they weren't doing their tent participation job, they were actually doing pretty much what you could say was, was even better in terms of supporting the community during that period. It's been a really difficult time, I've got to say, as everybody would probably agree, the last 18 months. 
Um, the team are now refocusing back on the, the tenant participation. Uh, we are getting lots of inquiries and lots of um, to, to start attending meetings again. Um, the meetings we have been doing tenant participation, we've been doing meetings, have been virtual. So we continue the couple of wee items that, that didn't happen. You'll see red on in the action plan is the scrutiny work. So we've all the, the tenants have always come in and did scrutiny, whether it's on the repair service or on the service, um, the allocation part, um, that had to stop. So we're now looking at starting that again. We're looking at starting the walkabouts. We're looking at starting the chairperson meetings. But physically starting them is what I'm saying. Up to now, the, the team have been back actually uh, carrying out virtual meetings with the tenants. And at the moment, it, it continues to go really, really well. So the action plans there is an area of the business I think we have developed over the last 20 years. We have nearly 70 tenants associations across, and most of these will be aware of a number of tenants and residents associations that contact yourself. They do a fabulous job out there, and they work really, really closely with the TP team. Uh, and it's certainly an area of business I'm really proud of and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Um, I would like to put on record uh, thanks uh, to the TP team uh, and the way in which they've reached out and stayed in touch with the tenants and residents associations across the authority during uh, the, the pandemic because the, many of the tenants and residents associations themselves uh, have either had to mothball their, 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 their approach or have completely diversified into community support organisations uh, beyond that housing. So it's been wonderful to hear and see the work that, that's been done. So really thanks and my congratulations to them for the, their efforts. Uh, I don't see any questions uh, in the in the chat bar uh, at the moment. So can we note uh, the recommendations on page 41, uh, colleagues? Thank you very much. We will now move on to item six, which is the new supply. Uh, and we'll go to uh, Pamela Humphreys, new supply. And it's a Coat Bridge circular. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, th this report is to um, seek the committee's approval in principle for the acquisition of um, 39 completed flats uh, within the former um, DWP building in Coat Bridge. This is obviously an example of um, what we were talking about earlier in terms of town centre regeneration and repurposing uh, of buildings that are really no, no longer uh, required for the, their previous purpose. So um, most members are probably aware the building's in a, a very central location in Cope Ridge um, and would therefore be uh, ideally uh, located in terms of access to amenities and, and transport and public transport and so on. It would also support, um, in addition to the town centre uh, regeneration plans, also uh, supports the, the reprovisioning um, plans in terms of uh, we're currently, as members are aware, emptying the, the, the council's multi-storey flats in that, that vicinity as well. In terms of um, this would be the first time that, that we've um, acquired units in, in this way, obviously as a conversion um, in, as opposed to new build. So in terms of uh, the, the potential risks involved, um, the council will obviously seek to, to minimise uh, any risk that the council would only purchase the units um, on completion by the developer. We, we will also uh, be, be monitoring uh, in terms of the, uh, the development as it goes through and with our own clerk of works to make sure that the, uh, the work's done um, to, to a satisfactory standard. Obviously, this is still subject to um, the development receiving planning permission uh, the planning application is in for this uh, and all uh, relevant statutory consents and building warranties. So um, all potential um, measures will be put in place in terms of mitigation of, of risk. In terms of the um, the, the, the price, uh, obviously the, the, the final acquisition price um, will be approved by the, the Finance and uh, Resources Committee as per uh, the Council's policy on um, acquisition and disposal of, of land and property. Um, the, the purchase price that, that has been agreed um, is, is obviously slightly higher, uh, as members can see, than what would be assessed as being the open market value. So, in effect, what um, you know, if you were buying a flat um, a, 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 in this building, what the current market value would be estimated to be. But the, the price does um, obviously reflect uh, what the current development costs are uh, that would be associated um, with the development and in, indeed uh, to, to bring the development to the, the, um, the council standards. And given, as we'll see it later on in, in the committee, um, the current council, uh, cost of uh, new build development, uh, overall it is assessed to be value for money um, and we would 
uh, therefore um, think that, that it is uh, a worthwhile project in terms of um, acquiring these uh, much needed units within Cope Bridge Town Centre. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pam. I appreciate that. Councillor Stubbs. Thanks, Heather. Just before I ask my questions, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a little sore throat. Um, where, where do we stand on the, uh, the rules of, for, for those of us that are planning uh, committee members, given that this is still to come before planning? We're asked to approve uh, the, the, the prospect of doing this, um, but then it's going to come before planning. Um, and we would, would, would we therefore not be able to vote in planning application because we're clearly showing support for it by voting to approve it today if we do. Is somebody able to give us a little bit of guidance on that before I go on to the actual substance of my comments? I'll, I'll comment if, if, if you want. I don't know if, if Mark's got anything to add, but um, what we're asking the Housing Committee or this committee is uh, the, to approve the principle of acquiring these units, um, and it is subject to um, uh, planning permission. So, and obviously all, all other statutory consents. So, um, when the, the report, uh, if it comes to uh, the, the planning committee, um, I'm not sure if it's uh, if it'd be a delegated matter, but uh, if it does, uh, then obviously the, the planning committee will be um, asked to consider uh, the, the planning um, aspects and the planning considerations. Uh, so this, I don't think there's a, a conflict there, unless Mark wants to comment differently. Convener, I would agree with uh, what, what uh, the, the officer has said. Um, it's two separate matters. There's, there's a proposition in front of members for the acquisition. Consideration of the planning permission um, is a separate um, approval um, and wouldn't require um, the members to declare an interest if they took part in decision making today. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. I appreciate that clarity. And to you, Pam. Right, Councillor Stubbs, can I come to your substantive comment, yep. please? Thank you. Question. Thank you both for that. Um, I've got a few comments on the on it. I wonder if um, Pam or MDL, the when I, the, the original plans that I saw for Cobridge Town Centre didn't include the conversion of this building. I, I, and unless I'm wrong, I understood that this building wasn't going to be there anymore from the plans that I saw. So, what has changed um, from the, the original Town Centre plan for Cobridge? Um, who are ML5 Limited? Are they a subsidiary of the council? It's a very specific uh, company title. Is it? Is it something that the council has set up? Um, just, just, just out of interest, or, or what? What other developments have they been involved in? If it's not the council that's involved in it, um, the I, I, I note from the report that it's got here that the open market estimated open market value would be one hundred and twenty-seven thousand pounds, which is considerably higher than than what a one-bedroom flat in Coatbridge. Coverage would have on average sell for, um, which makes the hundred and thirty eight and a half thousand pounds that we're intending to pay for them even higher still. I mean, I would I would suggest that a one bedroom flat in Coverage you could uh, you would be able to buy for somewhere between fifty and eighty thousand pounds, depending on the area that it's in. Um, so if we're potentially paying double, almost treble, um, what the open market value would it be a attempt to spend the money uh, purchasing uh, through the open market purchase scheme rather than than doing this, um, the uh, Heather, I've went and forgot my fourth point. So I'll leave it there. Um, if if we could get answers to those, and if it comes back to me, if you don't mind, let me back in. Sure. If there's if if you remember it, we can pick it up as a, a supplementary. Alan, that's not okay. that's not a problem. Pam, there's a number of questions there. Are you able to to answer those? So in terms of the the the, the town visions, um, I think it's important to stress that the, the town visions are are just that they, they are concepts in terms of looking at um, you know how the the overall um, makeup of the town centres could potentially change and, and different um, uses be brought into the the town centres. So there we were very clear, um, basically for, for for the reasons um, I suppose we're, we're now discussing that they couldn't be master plans, um, partly because we don't um, have the ownership uh, of most of the, the town centres, so we're not in direct control and we have to be flexible and able to respond um, to uh, opportunities and circumstances um, as they develop and arise, albeit keeping within the principles of um, of, of the visions um, that, that, that have been set out in the draft visions um, so, so far. So uh, in terms of um, being very specific about buildings, um, then, as I say, given that they were long-term um, concepts. I don't think this is uh, out of keeping 
uh, with the, the the principles of the the, the time vision for for Cope Vig, um, and it is obviously an opportunity that that, that has arisen. Um, as members might be aware, that I think the, the building has um, been empty for some time. Um, it was purchased, and I suppose to come on to your second point, um, it was purchased at, at auction um, by a, 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 a private company. So I don't have the, the name to hand, but um, and they have set up, uh, in effect, this subsidiary company um, to specifically to develop um, these uh, these units. Um, on behalf of the council, so the council has got no ownership interest um, in this company and no no involvement um, in the company either. Uh, the, the the parent company, um, as I say, whose, whose name I don't have to hand, um, is is a well, well established well established company and, and has done uh, you know other developments um, elsewhere. So uh, the council will and has done its due diligence in terms of um, of you know that aspect in terms of the. Uh, the suitability of dealing with the, the company, but uh, the, the council itself has, has no um, direct involvement or interest in, in the company. Uh, so we are like uh, anybody else. We are acquiring the units uh, on on completion and subject to, as I say, all the the, the, the due diligence being completed and, and the legal uh, arrangements being being in place. So um, in terms of the the value for money uh, aspect, then I suppose that. Uh, from our point of view, I mean, yes, of course, you can buy um, a, a certain flats in certain areas for for less than that. This uh, valuation was done in the market open market valuation was done specifically in relation to this particular uh, building. But I think it's worth saying that in the current market, you know, given costs, um, then you this wouldn't be done as a as a private commercial development because you you couldn't do the work. Um, and make a profit for for the you know for the the, the current open um, market value. So the only way that this um, stacks up as a residential development currently uh, is as a, an affordable development um, because we we obviously have uh, taken into account um, the, the cost of you know bringing it to the, the standards that, that that we require and getting the um, the warranties etc that we require. So. We, we have, have assessed uh, that it is still value for money at the, uh, the £138,500 uh, pound, um, on average per, per unit. And that is not um, replacing the ongoing um, buyback programme. So we, we will and, and are continuing um, to purchase uh, units as they come up, uh, and within, often within um, mixed tenure blocks and so on. So. As committee be well aware, we, we report to, to committee on a regular basis on that. So this isn't uh, in, in the place of, this is an addition to. Um, and I think from consultation with uh, House and Solutions colleagues, um, the, the view is that this would be um, a welcome additional uh, stock into the um, into the um, the council's house and stock in Copeledge. So hopefully that's answered the, the three points. And Pamela, I think the company name was Spectrum 360. Um, I, I remembered it took me back to my ZX Spectrum days as a as a kid playing on my computer. Uh, so that's how I remembered the, the company name. So that's who did the emails. Alan, did you remember your, your final point? No, I can't remember it, Heather. Only, only if, if you thanks for letting me back in, only to say that I very much welcome um, the development. I just hope that the, the council's not getting ripped off. That's my only concern. Um, but it's a, it's a good sized building. It's not very old in a great location. So. Um, they'll make great we'll, homes. We'll do diligence. Will be processed all the way, all the way through. Uh, Councillor Doherty, I can see you uh, waving. I'll come to you next, and then I'll come to Councillor uh, Valentine. Councillor Doherty. Pamela, can you tell us uh, when you envisage the start of this conversion and, and the completion of the conversion? So I was struggling to hear you. I think you're asking when when we think it would start. Um, I mean, I'll clarify and start and completion dates if you have any idea. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, as we've said, it is still subject to uh, planning permission and, and them getting the, the other consents in place. But, um, and obviously, as then concluding um, the, the missives um, with them. So, there, there's a number of stages uh, still to be gone through. But assuming that all goes um, smoothly and, and as, uh, as planned, I think the Earliest probably work would be starting 
would be early in the new year. Um, and I think the time scale that we've been given is uh, in the region of 12 months. So I think everything's a wee bit uncertain at the moment in terms of um, you know, time scales for, for, for um, construction work, but that, that's broadly speaking um, the, the time scales that, that we've been, been given. So it could start early in the new year and take approximately 12 months. Thanks very much. So start in 22 and finish in 23. That's well, in, a, in a nutshell. Councillor Valentine. Thanks, Chair. Uh, a couple of questions on 2.3 and page 56. A project consists of 39 flats and a mixture of one and two. Two wheelchair flats included in the housing mix on the ground floor. Now, I would have thought that uh, we'd be including more than that because we're looking at town centre stuff here. We're looking at the uh, elderly or infirm or whatever people have an access to the town centre, uh, surely we should have more than two within this complex that are wheelchair flats, wheelchair acceptable flats. So that's point one. Bullet, the first bullet point, uh, specifications, house and varied needs. Gas, uh, gas boilers and new metal roof. Now I'm under the impression that gas boilers, new gas boilers are going to be phased out in the near future. I, are we providing gas boilers for a new build? Basically, that's a new build. You call it conversion, but it's never been housing before. So, in my opinion, it's a new build. So, can you take up the point of gas boiler and a metal roof? Now, is that purely because of the structure of the building? Because a metal roof doesn't sound very eco-friendly to me. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Pam. Thanks. Um, maybe take the wheelchair um, point first. So in terms of obviously with it being a conversion, there, there are limitations, um, as you can imagine, uh, in, in terms of uh, what, what can be done within in the footprint. I think I suppose that the, the most important point um, you, you mentioned yourself was that all of the flats uh, will be housing for varying needs standards. So um, which basically means wheelchair accessible. Um, the, the wheelchair, specifically wheelchair flats are obviously you know, bigger in terms of um, circulation space and, and more suitable for, for permanent wheelchair users to, to live in them. Um, the, the flats also will have um, lifts so that there will be lift access. So I, I would argue that, um, you know, the flats are suitable, um, you know, for, for people, maybe some, some older people uh, and, and people with some mobility issues uh, because there will be housing for varying needs um, and, and that the, 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 the um, you know that there are lifts there. Uh, I think really the the the, the two wheelchair units, uh, fully um, wheelchair units, were uh, what was considered. Um, you know that could be accommodated uh, within the the ground floor within within the existing sort of, uh, footprint. So I think I don't think we could have got more fully wheelchair accessible flats, um, unfortunately. But uh, you're right. We obviously do try and strive for um, you know getting as many as we can within developments and, and we'll, we'll maybe pick up on that in the next report as well at municipal buildings. In terms of the, the metal roof, yeah, I, I believe, um, I don't know the, the, all the technical details, but yeah, I believe you're right in terms of that, that is uh, the, the most um, suitable uh, uh, structure. I um, understand that in terms of it being the place, then, um, you know, that would come with a, 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 at least a, a, a 10, if not 15 year uh, warranty attached. To that so ho hopefully um gives Brian some comfort in terms of the, the ongoing um, uh, maintenance of, of the roof. Um, I can't comment in terms of the uh, eco credentials so I'd, I'd maybe need to really come back to you um, on that in terms of um, how sustainable or otherwise. I suppose I just made a general comment that in terms of the reuse of this building um, and, and as opposed to demolition and new build then overall um, it is a more sustainable um, use in, uh, in, in terms of the um, reusing the, 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 the existing building um, as far as possible. The gas boilers, um, we are still fitting gas boilers um, and, and uh, as the most efficient uh, form of, of, of heating. Um, it's 2024 uh, in terms of um, the, the requirement to, to stop fitting gas boilers in new build properties. So um, and both in terms of our own programme uh, and as I think we've previously highlighted to committee, we are looking at um, alternatives and we've got some pilots on the go at the moment in terms of different um, sort of combinations of, of options. So 
Uh, that's still un underway and obviously it's uh, quite costly, very costly, I think it's fair to say, uh, currently. So um, I think we're quite comfortable that um, the, the proposal is and on this occasion that, that it would be gas borrowers that, that would be fitted. So hopefully that answers your questions. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing it. Oh, Councillor Castles, I'll come to you. Thanks, Sorry. Thanks Chair. It's just come into my head on one of the, the training days, one of the excellent training days we had about building and housing. Something's come into my mind. It, it's not about the property itself, but the property backs on to a pub and a, a nightclub, I believe. Um, it, will there be any issues? I'm not, I can't remember how close they are to each other. Will there be any issues or is it too soon to talk about that? That would have to be addressed over noise. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Castle. So um, that is obviously one of the uh, considerations in terms of the the, the planning uh, application. And in fact, I think um, the most so recent development uh, uh, is the submission of the, the noise impact um, assessment. So yes, uh, I suppose the short answer is that uh, they need to consider all of the noise sources, so the, the roads, um, potential other uh, neighbouring uses, and um, obviously the, the location of uh, of the, the sort of uh, as the supermarket and the deliveries. So all of those issues are being taken into consideration, and I suspect or I, I assume uh, that that will include um, probably looking at the glazing and, and different uh, the placement glazing. It's also likely that because this is a town centre development. Uh, that the council will uh, consider a, a sort of windows closed policy um, in terms of the looking at the standards that will be applied. But obviously that uh, is currently, I think, subject to consideration by our pollution control uh, colleagues, and they'll come back with uh, with their comments and recommendations. And that will, as you say, be part of the, the planning um, assessment. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. We have got the. Uh, recommendations uh, outlined on uh, page 55. Can we agree to approve and note them as is appropriate? Thank you very much, colleagues. We're moving on to item uh, 7 now, which is about the municipal buildings uh, on uh, Coldonan Street. Uh, Pam, can I come to you again, please? Yeah, so hopefully another um, good example of uh, the, the, um, the use of buildings uh, within our town centres, uh, and obviously this report has, or this um, uh, proposal has been considered by a committee previously. But this report is um, providing details of the outcome of the consultation that was carried out um, in terms of the proposed change of use of the municipal buildings uh, from council offices uh, to residential um, as uh, accommodation as part of the council's uh, new supply programme, and also uh, the retention of some. Uh, elements um, for office accommodation in terms of the, the council chambers and, and uh, committee room. The, the consultation was required to be carried out in accordance with the Community Empowerment Act, uh, and that's due to the building having what's known as common good status, uh, which means that we, uh, the council, in terms of um, being able to use it for other purposes, uh, would have to uh, petition um, the Court of Session to get that um, change of use um, agreed. And as part of that process, um, there, there was a requirement, as I say, to carry out the, uh, the this consultation. So, as uh, outlined in, in the report, um, the, the consultation uh, was undertaken, um, including the, the consultation with the um, community board members for, for Coke Bridge. And there was five um, uh, uh, responses uh, received. Uh, four were supportive. Um, and one um, was not supportive and wanted the, the building retained as, as a council head as council headquarters. The um, various comments uh, were also received, and um, the proposed responses to those uh, comments are, are also set out in the report. Um, and if approved, then uh, those uh, responses will be published and also sent uh, direct um, to the, 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 the people who, who raised the comments. Um, so basically, um, I think, given that uh, the, the general support, um, or certainly um, no uh, um, strong opposition to the, the proposals, it's now proposed um, that the council will proceed uh, to petition the court to seek approval to change the use of this common good asset and, and move forward, uh, hopefully, with the, the proposals for um, the, the conversion of Kildonan Street. I'm happy to take any questions, and I think Fiona's also on the call. If, um, she needs to 
answer anything from a legal perspective. Thanks very much, Pam. I appreciate uh, that report. Uh, Councillor Stubbs. I mean, everybody knows my opposition to this proposal, um, <clears throat> but except that I may be part of, part of a minority. <coughs> um, however, I don't think that we know what the, the general opinion of the public is um, at the moment because of the, the, the climate in which the consultation was run. Um, and that's not a criticism of anybody. You, you, you can only, um, you know, you can only do what you can do. Um, nobody can determine the climate that's going on. Um, Heather, we do have an amendment. I do have a couple of questions before the amendment's put up, um, and then I'll speak to that if that's okay. Um, how often do we go to the court of session to, to overturn contracts uh, like this, where, where a, a, an historic building is gifted to the people of Coatbridge or any other town in North Lanarkshire? Um, and we go to the court of session to, um, to do away with the, the, the wishes of the individual or the family who, who bequeathed that to the, the people. Um, and what is the cost of going to the court of session to doing that? Um, if I can get those those two answers, um, just because I, I, I don't see it in the report, I've not I've not had them before. Um, and then I'll I'll ask Mark to um, put up the amendment if that's okay, Heather. Um, Councillor, I, I can answer that. First of all, on, on the costs, um, what we've been advised by um, council is that we're looking if there's no no opposition. And all procedural matters go are straightforward. We're talking um, just up to about eleven thousand pounds plus VAT. But that, that's where it, it's not opposed. In terms of the um, the the removal of the asset from you know being a benefit to the community, the the argument is that the social housing element does still provide that, and I would actually argue increases the benefit to the the Coatbridge community. But in answer to your, your question about the court of session process, it is actually a very rare um, procedure, and that's why we've taken um, council's advice on the matter. And, and I'm happy that we're, we're complying with all the, you know, the, the legislative requirements. Heather, if I can. Yeah, councillor Oh, there um, Eleven thousand plus that. If if it's not opposed, what is the cost? If it is opposed, or the potential cost? Uh, we can't give an estimate on that, but the, the cost would um, possibly um, rise substantially. It, de it depends on what the court decides in terms of procedure and also if people were going to come into the case to be, be heard by the court. But I, unfortunately, I can't give an estimate of that at the moment. There are no other questions in the chat bar just now. Okay, Councillor Stubbs. Yes, thank you. Mark, do you have a note of that? Are you circulating that to, to members or are you sharing it on screen? Yeah, I'm going to share it on screen, convener. I'm just, um, just bear with me. It's not allowing me to share content. Just just to be second. Leslie's going to email it to elected members just now. Leslie, if you can do that while I um, just look at my <laughs> to, to get it up on the screen, just bear with me. Yeah, I just want to make sure members have got enough time to. Yeah, to absolutely, it. absolutely. Thank you for your patience, convener. Just, just for um, the admin, Heather, it will be Tracy Carriker that seconded it um, rather than Alan. Thank you. Are you happy for me to go? I've got three points on this. Is there another bit to go scroll down, Mark? Is there more points on this? No, this is
So it was a three point item. Is that correct? That's that right, one? yeah. Yeah. Right, I just want to make sure that everybody's been the opportunity to to read that. Thank you very much. Alan, would you like to move your amendment? Yeah, I'll not go on for ages, Heather. Just um I, I, I don't want this um I don't want this to appear as any sort of political manoeuvre or anything else. It is simply about making sure that we are doing all we can to to get to gather the opinions of the people of Cobridge before um we, we make a final decision on an historic building in the in the right in the centre of the town. Um the the main point is that the consultation was run um during a full lockdown. Um people really weren't concentrating on things like that. There wasn't very much uh, on that by way of social media activity or printed media, uh, printed press activity that I saw to notify people. And the building was closed. The building has been closed to the public for about a year and a half. Um, so an A4 uh, poster in the window um, just isn't going to be seen. Um, so it, it's likely, it's inevitable, that the vast majority of the people of Cobridge probably won't even know that this is going on. Um, and I know that uh, obviously there's the comments that it's been at the community board, which is probably where the comments have come from um, in terms of the responses to the consultation. But we all know ourselves that community boards can be very well attended and can be very poorly attended, and it's just your luck on the night. Um, all we're asking for is is for this just to delay it very briefly. Uh, as I said bef before, we moved brought the amendment forward. Everybody knows my opposition to it, but I'm not I'm not act, I'm not going to sit here and act as if I'm. The, the, I, I know the thoughts and minds of every single person in Cobridge, um, or even in Cobridge North, for that matter. Um, we need to ask. Um, we need to do a neighbour notification um, where we can in the immediate vicinity around about the town hall, and we need to um, put more on on social media and printed press, and then go back to the community board um, with a much more uh, a much clearer, more clearly advertised. Um, Discussion um, that the, the town hall is um, is potentially going to be turned into housing, and ultimately, if the people of Cobridge um, want to respond in favour of it, then that's the right decision. Um, but I think that we have to ask the question um, in less difficult times um, than what we were in, when everybody was was locked in the house uh, and not able to, um, to to go about their ordinary business and concentrating far more on on other things than than. The, the future of a, a building in the, the centre of Coat Bridge. Um, so the amendment itself, uh, it, it's, it speaks to its own uh, aims. Um, it's got quite specific um, requests and how we go about uh, carrying out the consultation. Um, I'm not asking for it to drag on for months and months and months. It, it could, this could all be done um, within the next cycle and it brought back to the next housing committee for a decision based on any responses that we get. Um, and I would, I'd be very grateful if members would support the amendment. Would your seconder like to speak to the amendment? Thanks, Heather. Sorry, I've got my camera off because I'm having some like Wi-Fi issues here. I think Alan um, basically spoke well to, to the amendment. Um, there will have been not a lot of football, football sorry, going by the, the building you know, so we don't know how many people have actually saw it. As far as the the community boards, it's not. I know it's community groups that are there, but it isn't necessarily like members of the public. So we don't actually know how many people are aware of this. And I think as as Alan pointed out, he didn't see quite you know a lot of um, information on on social media and such. And and Alan, he's obviously an elected member for that area and didn't see it. So we we really don't know how many actual residents of. Uh, Coatbridge North saw so it. Never mind um, the rest of Coatbridge. So I, I think it's it's just given a wee bit more time, just to allow more consultation, allow more people to know to be aware that this um, is a proposal. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, colleagues. It would be my uh, intention to move the paper as uh, it's uh, is written because this committee has already uh, afforded this development. Um, or potential development in principle uh, at approval. Uh, there has been social media and uh, print press and, and poster uh, 
notification uh, across the community. That in no way prevents any uh, community group um, articulating a view at any part through the statutory consultation processes, uh, through planning uh, other, or in other uh, channels. So uh, it would be my intention to move uh, the, the paper as, uh, as, as written and the recommendations as is outlined on page 61. Uh, can, so, um, can I have a seconder for that, please? Chair, it's Councillor. If you want. Chair, it's Councillor O'Rourke. Uh, as the Vice Convener, I formally second the motion and the recommendations attached. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll open the floor for any conversation once in. I've got Councillor Logue has uh, intimated that he would like to contribute. Yeah, certainly. Thanks very much, Heather. I mean, I totally agree with your comments, Heather. And once again, we see a situation where we go out for consultation. There are five respondents to the consultation. Four are very supportive of the strategy endorsed by a previous committee. One is not supportive. But what we've heard today is, wait a minute, let us now malign that consultation process. It was done during COVID, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The world stopped. Let us go back out. It's a classic example where if we don't get what we want in a consultation, we malign the process and then we say go back out again. Fundamental to this, we all know Alan's views on this. He's articulated them openly and widely for some time. But the question is, we all know that that building is surplus to requirements. And another report is coming to PNS committee this month, next month, which clearly highlights the provision of office accommodation throughout North Lancashire. If it is not going to be used for office accommodation, what can it be used for? What does Alan envisage a future use of this building? If he does not want residential, it cannot be used for office. So I think it's incumbent upon Alan to tell us what other options he thinks would be acceptable for the conversion of that building. It's an absolute nonsense to continue this. He clearly does not want that to become a residential provision, and he should just come out openly and state that. Councillor Gourley. Heather, when you look at the redevelopment we've done in Carnegie Library, the houses we've put in there, it's stunning. It's a credit to the town. It's a credit to the council. And to develop that within the town hall, which is of absolutely very little use to anyone, I think we must go ahead and put houses in it along with office accommodation. It is a fantastic building. The, the structure in itself will ch on the front will change very, very little. So I think we really must go ahead and convert it into useful housing for the people of this town who are desperate for housing. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Gourley. And of course, the Carnegie Library got some uh, awards as well uh, about this development. Councillor Doherty, I see you uh, waving. Councillor Doherty, you don't appear to have your mic on. Can you put your headset on and move your mic close to your mouth, please? Can't hear you, Kevin. Move your mic close to your mouth. Can you? Can I hear you? Yeah. Chair, yeah. sure, this this building's been it's been empty now for over a year, and the longer the lanes build it uh, empty, the more attracted it is to the vandals, and we don't want to turn this beautiful building into a, an eyesore. And I think the quicker we start doing something with it, the better. So we. Uh, I would move with the motion. Thanks very much, Councillor Doherty. Councillor Lennon. Yeah, thanks Hello. very much. I'm, I'm kind of perplexed in relation to the debate that's currently taking place in relation to the building. We've just had the council leader there suggest that Councillor Stubbs should come back with usage. Yet yeah, the very point that Councillor Stubb makes is in relation to the lack of consultation that's took place. Surely we should be putting this back to the public and asking the public what they would like to see within that, that building itself. Now, to touch upon Councillor Bewley and Councillor Dock at these points, in relation to the building not being used, we have had a pandemic, and I think that everybody agrees that that's created some issue in relation to this. 
in this subject matter, but the reality is now we're coming out at it and people are coming back. So why not rerun the consultation process and actually find out exactly what people want the usage for this building being? Are we afraid as a council to ask the public? Because it certainly seems that way with Councillor Lowe's comments. I've got no other uh, comments uh, in, in the chat bar. Uh, Alan, as the mover of the amendment, would you like to sum up? I'm disappointed in Jim um, when I, I, the, the, the amendments he moved with the best intentions um, and he's trying to turn it political because he doesn't like, simply doesn't like people questioning things that he's decided. The, it, 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 it says uh, that Alan Stubbs has made his, his opinions perfectly clear for some time and they're well articulated and then he says he doesn't want to be housing, he's just come out and say it. Well, I've either, I've either said it or I haven't, Jim. I have said that I don't think it's the appropriate use for the Coatbridge Town Hall. That's my opinion. I've also said that I don't ex accept, I don't uh, ex expect it to be the opinion of everybody in Coatbridge. I'm not trying to act as if I'm the spokesman for Coatbridge here. I'm asking you to speak to the people of Coatbridge and see what they think it should be for. Greg's absolutely right. Ask the question, what do people want done with it? Do they want it to be housing? Maybe they do. Do they want it to be a town hall again? Maybe they want that. Do they want it to be a community centre? Or do they want it to go back to being offices? Because without going into the politics of it, because I didn't want to do that, but we'll have to go respond to the point that you're making. You you, you raised the issue of the rationalisation of office accommodation across North Lanarkshire, and Coatbridge has been really badly affected by that. More or less all of the offices in Coatbridge have been closed. And everybody is, and this is this goes across the whole the whole authority. Um, everybody's been shipped into two or three buildings over in Motherwell, um, and that's great for the local economy there, but it's not very good for the economy elsewhere. So, if it, it, it's not for me to decide what the building's going to be, is is the point, Jim? It's it's you know, you're, you're the leader of the council. You've obviously got your opinion on it. You want to force it through like you do everything else, but let's speak to the people. Let's not be scared of what the people have to say. Thanks very much for your comments, uh, Alan. And uh, it was me that moved uh, this this paper. It wasn't um, the the leader of the council. Um, it was this committee and indeed this council that uh, endorsed the town centre vision, where we would find a balance of investing in our heritage uh, by keeping um, the, the best of our historical landmarks, but actually trying to purposely utilise them for modern and future proofing our life uh, and the, the common purpose of much of that is to enable housing to be located within our town centres, bringing that footfall and that opportunity to people to live in our town centres. And this paper very clearly has had the support of the committee and the council in the past and has the support of the community uh, uh, or those who have taken the time to respond, having seen the social media and the paper uh, and poster comments, uh, seeking their, their views. There will, of course, be continued consultation through the statutory means uh, going forward. So I will move the paper as uh, as, uh, as it is written. Uh, Mark, can I ask you to take us to the vote, please? Thank you, convener. Just to clarify, we've got an amendment from uh, Councillor Stubbs and Councillor Carricker. Um, so I'll, I'll just run through that. There is a few members um, not in the meeting, so just just bear with me. So Councillor uh, Beveridge is not present. So Councillor Brannan McVeigh. I move the motion. Okay. Councillor Burgess. Motion. Councillor Burrows. Motion. Councillor Cameron is not present. Councillor Carricker. Amendment. Councillor M. Coyle is not present. Councillor Sophia Coyle. Amendment. Councillor Curry is an apology. Uh, Councillor Damasio. Amendment. Councillor Doherty. Motion. Councillor Doolan. Motion. Councillor Douglas. Motion. I don't think Councillor Farouk is on the meeting. Councillor Fisher is, is, is an apology as well. Um, Councillor Fotheringham. Amendment. Councillor Goldie. Amendment. Councillor Gourley. Motion. Councillor Graham. Motion. Councillor Hogg. I believe is not on the meeting. Councillor Jones, I believe, is not on the meeting. Councillor uh, Paul Kelly. Motion. 
Councillor Kerr's not on the meeting. Councillor Lennon. Amendment. Councillor Logue. Motion. Councillor McGregor's not on the meeting. Uh, Councillor McLaren's not on the meeting. Councillor McManus. Amendment. Councillor McNally's not on the meeting. Councillor McNeil. Motion. Councillor McVeigh. Motion. Councillor Morgan's not on the meeting. Councillor O'Rourke. Motion. Councillor Pettigrew. Amendment. Councillor Shevlin, I believe, is not on the meeting. Councillor Shields. Motion. Councillor Stokes is an apology. Councillor Allen Valentine. Amendment. Councillor Annette Valentine. Amendment. Councillor Weir. I don't see Councillor Weir on the meeting. We'll now come to the, the, the sub substitutes. Councillor Castles. Motion. Councillor uh, T. Johnston. Amendment. Councillor McCulloch. Motion. Councillor McGowan. Amendment. Councillor Stubbs. Amendment. Thank you, uh, elected members. The amendment has attracted 13 votes. The motion has attracted 16 votes. The motion is carried. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for that. We'll move on to item 8, uh, and that's on page 69. Uh, Pam, can I come to you for that? It's on the future new build sites. Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener. So um, this report, uh, is again, seeking approval for some additional sites to be added uh, to the new supply programme um, and also uh, looking for approval for, um, again, some potential uh, additional off-the-shelf purchases of completed uh, homes um, as well at Gart Ferry Road and Downfield Road in Cumbernauld. So the two sites um, that we're looking to um, add to the programme uh, uh, would be at Koshnuk Road in, in Milliston um, in Steps, which is just uh, near the a small site that the council developed at the start of the, the new build programme, um, and also another town centre site at the former Methodist Church at Caledonian Road in Wishaw. And as I said, the off-the-shelf purchases, which again uh, is subject to um, planning uh, approval and, and all the relevant due diligence and uh, acquisition Place being approved by Finance and Resources Committee. Uh, those two sites are, are as outlined in 2.2, um, which is at Gartfair Road in, in Moody'sburn and um, at Downfield Road in uh, Cumbernauld. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Pam. Councillor Valentine, can I come to you first, please? Thanks, Chair. Uh, page 75, Mabel Street in Motherwell. Now, I know you've said, Tether, that we, we shouldn't be, you know, doing constituency stuff in here. However, this is the only project that's ever been on hold. Everything else has been completed. So I'm taking it out of the, the the ward issue, if you like. Well, I'm trying to. I hope you bide with me on that one. So it's on hold. It's been on hold for 18 months, two years, Pamela. What's happening with it? And please quash the local rumours that it is becoming a, a Sainsbury's or Tesco, uh, what do you call them? Small, small ones. So, thanks, uh, Councillor Valentine. So, yeah, there's a number of issues with uh, with this site, as, you, as you're well aware. Um, it is still uh, a site that we would be looking to develop for um, the Council's new supply programme. It's very much a, a good site um, for, for the obvious reasons in, in terms of its location. Um, the issues uh, that are still um, are still the issues are the uh, two Scotch water um, connection issues, whereby, as we've, I think, spoken about previously, um, there's a number of challenges now in, in terms of quite, quite often with these um, infill brownfield sites about trying to get connection um, for the, the surface water. So um, Scotch Water's policy, as you know, is um, much more strictly applied now in terms of being able to uh, connect to the combined sewer with surface water. And that uh, has been very problematic across a number of sites, including this one. Um, so we've, we've been trying to work with Scotch Water on a number of sites um, to find solutions 
Um, and at the moment, we're still working on finding a solution to Mabel Street. While that was ongoing, we didn't feel it was appropriate then, and also conscious of um, you know the the, the circumstances um, around uh, the, the pandemic, we didn't feel it was then appropriate to also um, be seeking to um, move the the boxing club, which was the, the has always been uh, the, the the main issue and um, problem in terms of being able to develop the site. So the, those two issues are the main the the outstanding issues, but um, we felt it was more appropriate to try and get the Scottish Water Solution. Um, agreed first uh, before we then have to look at what the options are for the boxing club, which, to be honest, are still not uh, clear because of the boxing club's uh, financial circumstances. Even if we found alternative uh, premises for them, which we haven't been able to do that that, that are suitable to the boxing club, um, then th there was a, an issue about whether they, they had the financial uh, capacity, obviously, then to, to pay um, the, the rental because they're not currently pay paying. Um, for, for the, the ground lease, um, which is also an issue that uh, we have to resolve. So those are still the issues, I'm afraid, Councillor Valentine, and I, I apologise that it has taken so long um, because we are, like you, keen to, to move this site forward. So um, I'll keep, you know, we'll keep um, progressing as, as best we can, but it's got to work with the I think needs to be, be sorted first, um, and, and then we need to look at the, what, what we do uh, about the boxing club. Thanks, Councillor Valentine. Councillor Graham. Uh, thank you, Heather. I'd just like to commend the service for bringing the downfield road development and coming all forward. A number of the officers will know exactly what I mean. Uh, there's, there's this is to me, I, I think Councillor Goldie would echo this, has been great over the last number of years. This is a very, very welcome development. And my thanks to all. Thanks, Councillor Graham. I'm sure that those uh, positive comments are appreciated by the service. Um, Councillor McGowan, do you need in on this report just in advance of you? Do you leave in? No. Okay. Thank, thanks, Agnes. Uh, Councillor Goldie. Thanks, Convener. Yes, just uh, as Councillor Graham has said, the uh, Kingfisher site has been uh, of interest, shall I say, to us over a number of years. Uh, it straddles uh, ward, uh, both wards coming all south and uh, the next ward, essentially. It's just some questions on it. My understanding historically was that there were potential issues with the ground on this site, uh, and that was the reason why the CDC didn't build houses on it. They built a pub on it. Uh, subject to planning permission, if there's found to be issues with the ground on the site, essentially, how does that fall? Uh, I take it there would have to be ground improvements done. Would that fall at the, the cost to the council? or to the developer. And it's just the fact that, uh, and I note that it's going to go to the Finance and Resources Committee, the fact that we're committing to buy if planning permission is granted, are we sure that we can get a reasonable price on it? Uh, there's just a wee bit of concern on that, that we look to be buying the whole development subject to planning permission. It's just if the planning permission fails, does it essentially mean that it doesn't go ahead and if there's ground issues on the site, who would pay for it? Thanks, Councillor Gordon. Pamela, can you answer, Councillor Goldie? Sorry, but thanks. Um, yeah, and I mean, I suppose the uh, the, the process for for these off the shelf purchases um, has, has always been a wee bit, um, you know, try to get one step at a time. And th this committee, I suppose, what we're asking is approval in principle in terms of, um, you know, is this committee. Uh, comfortable or supportive of these um, these units potentially coming in as, uh, to the new supply program, um, and then the other stages of the process, as, as you've outlined, um, the the development would have to get planning permission and all the other consent as part of the, the planning permission process, and, and and the consent process, as you say, is is around um, site investigations, uh, any other um, you know environmental reports, and so on. So. Uh, and that is all on the developer that the obviously the advantage, if you like, of off the shelf purchases is uh, that the, the council's only you know only obliged to, to purchase the houses on completion um, uh, and obviously to the all the the, the, the relevant um, standards and with all the, the certific certification in place. So 
um, you know, that's the comfort from, from that point of view. And equally, as you say, the price, um, ultimately, we, we, we have to um, be comfortable that the price represents value for money. So, um, and that, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. so the council's uh, process is that that gets approved by the, the, the Finance and Resources Committee. So it is a wee bit, um, you know, uh, you know, different stages to go through. So I suppose at this stage, um, we, we are uh, still um, just asking for uh, approval in principle if we can get all these other things uh, to, to stack up. And that includes, as you say, planning and, and the, the, the price. Um, so it's, I suppose it's not, it's not an absolute certainty. Uh, that, that this will definitely happen, but, but we would be if everything ha if everything else can um, work through, then we would be uh, keen, I think, to, to bring these units um, in, into the, the new supply program. Thanks, Convener. Just happy that the appropriate process will go through, and with that, I'm content. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. I've got no further comments, but I think it is worth noticing uh, in the executive summary, you know, there's 833 new build homes being completed and 339 are in development. So we're making substantial uh, progress and I'm sure we all welcome the, the new sites being added to the list. So can we uh, approve uh, the recommendations that are on page 69, please? Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item uh, nine, it's the strategic uh, housing and investment pro uh, plan, the SHIP for short. Uh, Pam, can we come to you, please? Yeah, thanks. And uh, hopefully so you'll, you'll allow me to use the shorthand as well. Um, it's the less of a mouthful. So um, this report, I think committee will be relatively familiar with by now because um, we bring it annually um, to seek approval for um, new affordable housing projects to be included um, within the, the, the ship that covers a, a five-year period. So we, we update it annually and it gets submitted to the Scottish Government um, for consideration and includes both um, Council's um, projects in terms of its new supply programme and also uh, housing association projects. And all of the projects uh, or the proposals are, are assessed uh, in terms of um, you know, deliverability um, and contribution to the, the council's local housing um, strategy. So, uh, hopefully, to make sure that they do meet, um, you know, meet, meet the needs of the the, the local people, um, and also, uh, I say that our wider regeneration uh, authorities as well. We also obviously uh, want to make sure that we maximise the resources available to the council area from the Scottish government through the affordable housing supply programme. So, it's important to make sure that we have got. Uh, a good um, pipeline of projects coming through um, that, that can um, obviously uh, make sure that we, we maximise uh, the funding that's available. We have, um, uh, we welcome the fact that we've now got a resource uh, planning assumption in terms of the, the resources that are likely to be available um, over the next, uh, the current year and the, the future four years um, as, as about £170 million. Pounds. So that's uh, funding. Um, that, that can be committed and invested uh, in terms of increasing the, the affordable supply across North Lanarkshire. So in terms of the, the format of the report, um, again, committee will, will be familiar. Uh, the Appendix 1 includes projects that were previously approved by committee for the previous SHIP, but will obviously require resources uh, within the, the new SHIP from um, next year, 22-23. Uh, and also in Appendix 2, uh, which is the, the new, um, the, the proposed new uh, projects that we are proposing to add uh, to the ship. I would, uh, however, point out one um, uh, amendment to Appendix 2, though, that the former Willowbank School, Bank Street, Cope Bridge, I think we've indicated that that, that was um, subject to approval at this committee. So that, that site is not yet, that's still under consideration. So that should... Uh, not be in that appendix two at the moment. So that uh, if, if it's decided that that we would bring that forward, that would obviously come to uh, a future committee. So apologies um, that that uh, uh, development is in appendix two. So that that wasn't uh, as he, as you probably have noted wasn't a uh, part of the previous um, report in terms of uh, sites to be added to the program. But apart from that, um, the uh, sites that are outlined in appendix two. Are the sites that we would propose that we would add to the the, the ship, um, and that would help contribute um, to uh, the delivery of the affordable supply program. Um, so overall, I think that between Appendix One and Two, you'll see about um, over two thousand six hundred potential 
um, affordable uh, housing um, units to be delivered across North Lanarkshire um, in terms of meeting our priorities. I suppose it's also important to point out, um, as we know, not all of these projects are likely to be uh, come to fruition. There will be issues or reasons why it, it may not be possible to progress certain projects. So at this stage, it's not a guarantee that these projects will be delivered, but it allows um, the particularly the housing associations to to move forward in terms of um, design development and progressing uh, proposals um, for, uh, for for these projects. So um, I think that. That's uh, all I'd want to say in the report, convener, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Can I go to Councillor Valentine first, please? Thanks, Chair. Uh, on page 85, there's two, and it's, it's maybe going back to Alan Stubbs' comments earlier, but it's two older iconic buildings within Motherwell, uh, the Town Hall and the, the YMCA building. Uh, are we any further forward with that? There's a uh, local press comments that we're knocking half it down, uh, the town hall one. Uh, so really what I'm looking for here is an update as to where we are in both those uh, buildings. Thanks. Pam, do you have that information to give at the meeting today? Yeah, Councillor Valentine. So in terms of the Motherwell Town Hall, um, that uh, proposal, that, sorry, that project has uh, recently Secured planning permission, so the the drawings and layouts are, are um, available on the uh, the planning portal. So I'm, I'd be happy to send you the the link to that, or certainly the the reference number, um, so you can see it. The and the and the acquisition of that building therefore has also been completed um, and purchased. So um, from NL properties, North Lancashire properties, the, there is. So the, the obviously the main facade and and uh, and, and or the main building um, is retained. The only bit that has been that will be demolished is I think the the hall uh, at the back. So a wee bit similar to um, somebody was talking earlier about Canadian Library, where a, a part of the, the the building at the back was demolished, and that obviously allows for um, a courtyard um, to then be created, uh, and obviously provides the light and so forth into the uh, into the um, the units that will be converted. So. I think um, the the proposals basically retain the the the, the old part of the building um, and make uh, make best use um, of the site. Uh, and as I say, those drawings are are available um, for for any members to to look at. So that that one is moving um, is hopefully moving forward quite well. In terms of the um, YMCA, it's probably at a slightly earlier stage um, of development, so it's not yet. Um, um, Got, got planning permission, but the, the design development is, is ongoing. And again, uh, the, the intention is to, to retain certainly the, the, the older part of the front of the, the YMCA. And as you know, that's combined with the, the development of the, the Brandon Street site um, nearby with a uh, demolition towards the rear. So uh, one of the challenges obviously of, of the YMCA site is um, around the, the noise sources that are nearby. Um, including the the steel work, so again that will be an important part of the, the submission um, for for planning permission in terms of any mitigation um, that that we put in around the acoustics for uh, for, for the the development. But again, both so both sites are um, are being progressed in terms of design uh, development, and the 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 Motherwell Town Hall site has now got plan permission. So hopefully that. Uh, answers your question, but happy to provide any further information um, if you want. I have no other comments in the uh, or request to speak uh, in the chat bar. We've got a, an important uh, report before us here, colleagues, so we have to note and approve this with the, the exception articulated by Pam about Willow Bank. So can we approve and note those recommendations, please? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Moving on now to item uh, 10. Uh, colleagues, you received an updated report along uh, with uh, your uh, papers um, that just gave some updated information. Cameron uh, Barr, can I come to you, please, to speak to this report? Thanks, Convener. <clears throat> um, the purpose of this morning's report is to seek committee approval to further extend the current repairs and maintenance arrangements with the Scottish Fair Veterans Garden Association, um, which has been in place since May 18. Um, as a previous extension was approved in February 20, 
um, which will expire this month. Um, the further extension um, would give a, a review dates of the 31st of March 2022, with a further option to extend that by another year into 2023. So we're seeking approval this morning at committee to, to put that up, uh, proposal in place. Is there any comment on that, eh, colleagues? Are we happy to approve this? Happy to approve. Thank you very much, colleagues. Moving on sorry, to... Chair, I, I just put one in there. Oh, just my a, apologies, a uh, Alan, in you come. Just a quick question. Uh, on the original paper, uh, we were talking about going on to January 2024 on this, and now we're cutting that back. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any issues with the maintenance of these buildings, uh, and it's all going smoothly. I was just asking why uh, it's cut back from 2024 to the earlier one here, I think it's the 31st of March 2023. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Cameron, can you respond? Sure. Um, absolutely, Councillor. Um, it was our original intention to put the new arrangement in place until January 24. However, the request to make a shorter timeline was actually at the veterans' request. I think they're reviewing their internal processes, so they wanted a shorter, a sort of shorter timeline for that. So, um, yeah, we've got the option to extend it if need be, but it was at their request rather than the council officers. Thanks very much, uh, Cameron. That's appreciated. Uh, can we approve that report, colleagues? Thank you. Moving on to item A11, uh, uh, and this is one where those eagle-eyed uh, folk would have noted a, a typo. Uh, in the recommendations, uh, there's reference to the Enterprise and Communities Committee, and of course, there is no such a, com a committee. So it's the Housing and Regeneration Committee that, of course, should be referenced in this report. So if we can take that uh, as read, uh, Cameron, can I get you to tell us about the support as the forced entry electrical upgrades report. Sure, thanks, Convener. Um, this report requests that committee considers and approves um, the proposal to force access to undertake electrical system upgrades. Um, and we would, we would look to mirror the process which is already in place to where we force entry to do undertake gas servicing and electrical systems testing. Um, as you will all be aware, the, the legislation and the statutory requirements changed. Uh, where we have to go in and up upgrade existing smoke detection systems. And by originally February 21, however, we were given special dispensation to move that to February 22. Um, we've, we've now knocked, all, to all intents and purposes, knocked all of the doors on our 36,500 stock, with the exception of the sheltered complexes, which have got slight kind of, uh, specific arrangements in place. Um, and we've, we've, we've had a number of refusals. Um, it would be our intention to go back and try and you know, get in without forcing access. However, um, where there's people who are uh, not letting us in, we need that ability to go in and actually undertake the works um, in advance of the February 22 deadline. Um, so this, this report seeks approval to go in and undertake electrical system upgrades on the back of uh, new legislation or statutory requirements being in place um, in February 22, and also other electrical system upgrades as a result of electrical systems testings that may come thereafter. Thanks very much, Cameron. I've got a few questions on the chat bar. Councillor Burgess, come to you first. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Cameron, I'm basically happy, happy with the paper, but uh, I've already asked the uh, uh, officials um, uh, for help um, uh, with the, the new uh, alarms that have got to be in for February, um, and in, especially owner occupiers, of which there are two, um, and they're elderly, and they're looking for help. Uh, to get these in, they're quite happy with paying for the, the units, but the, the walls are 10 feet high. Um, and I was just wondering, is there uh, help for people uh, within that particular area of, uh, of age and the uh, ability to get an alarm into the house? Absolutely, Councillor Burgess. Yeah, it wouldn't be necessarily be something that the council would undertake on their behalf. However, if I can speak to you offline, I can certainly give you, you, know, give you a signpost the relevant kind of organisations that could assist, whether that be care repair or possibly even the fire brigade. But yeah, there will be no problems kind of giving you that information. Super, Cameron. Thank you. Now come to Councillor Castles now, please. Thanks, Chair. Just maybe an indirect question, maybe a bit unfair to ask it, but it's just when it says all domestic property, is that all domestic property? Is it all council renter property or all social housing? And will it affect private landlords as, as well? Thanks. Yes, so the purpose of this report is to seek approval for us to go in to our own uh, stop 
and uh, make sure that we're compliant in terms of the legislation. But you'll have seen that there's been a sort of national campaign to, make, to generate awareness around uh, people being made aware of that, regardless whether you're an owner, whether you're a tenant, or whether you're a landlord, this is a responsibility for all domestic stock. So, yeah, the, the purpose of us can undertake it, we would only do that in our own properties. However, yes, the, you know, there is a wider kind of, uh, requirement there under legislation that all domestic properties have to have, have to be in new legislation. Thanks very much. Can I come to Councillor Valentine, please? Thanks, Chair. Uh, some concerns within my group meeting on Monday night with regards to this, where we understand that it's obviously happened with gas over the years, and Stephen pointed out earlier on that we had one where we had actually to claim a fail because we didn't get one in because of the COVID social isolating. However, the, the electricity part of it and the, the the new CO2 and fire monitors, eh, do we really require to have this? And the reason I'm coming back on it is one of my colleagues in Cope Bridge, who's in, eh, a councillor for the Millbrae area, the, the, apparently the contractors in there have been not very polite to the residents and have, this is hearsay, so I've got to say that first, but I've sort of threatened the council tenants within those areas that if they don't open their door to allow them in, then they will be evicted. Now, I know that's hearsay, that came from the councillor of the area. I, I'm just, I'm concerned with that in the background, what we're asking to do here. And a second point, if I may, how many properties do we, on a regular, uh, say a yearly basis, actually force entry in because we've now had this uh, the, the five-year electrical service test ongoing now so how approximately how many actually houses do we force entry into per year thanks chair okay so probably taking the first point councillor valentine I'll, I'll take that one back to the contractor because absolutely under no uh, terms should there be any can i know threats or any you know, of that ilk um, to any tenants right from a contractor or a council officer. So that's certainly something that you know, I'll take back with them. Um, I've been known, been aware of the kind of project itself. Um, I know that there's sprinkler installations going on in conjunction with the detector. So that's a sort of non-legislative uh, requirement that we're kind of putting in place. Um, but certainly I'll, I'll take that one back. Um, in relation to your second point around numbers, in the grand scheme of things, it's very small numbers. Um, I've got actually got the figure in front of me here. So in relation to gas servicing, um, we we serve we service over just over thirty two thousand properties that have got gas every year, um, and from that we get roughly about two thousand eight hundred uh, refusals uh, on that basis, um, which we take then take forward to um, the forced entry process. When that then is initiated, um, that then goes down to around about ten percent of that. So there's initially two thousand, uh, roughly about eight percent, eight or nine percent of refusals at the first pass. But then when we go and speak to them about the, the option to go down the forced entry route, given that we're being refused, um, that, that goes down by about 90 per cent. So we actually only uh, forced entry and for gas servicing um, last year of just over the 280, so under 1 per cent. Um, those figures are actually kind of mirrored to a degree in the electrical systems testing, and we do that over a five-year program. Um, so we do have seven, roughly 7,500 properties for EST, electrical systems testing, every year. Um, of which 728 went to the, the forced entry process. And of that 728, only about 73 we actually had to force it, force entry on. So that's that's the kind of the processes that's already established. Um, we anticipate that being mirrored for the electrical systems upgrades as well. So we've had circa 3,000 refusals to date. Um, I anticipate only having to force access to a maximum of about 300 um, if I get approval today to do so. Um, but that would be a complete last resort. We would work with the tenants, we would show them the benefit and give them the enhancement. And we're actually probably in a better position given there is a national uh, television campaign, etc. So there is a general awareness of the need to do that. So I'm hopeful that the, the 300 forced access would be a worst, worst case scenario. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks very much. Um, colleagues, can you make sure that those members of this committee and indeed colleagues across the political groups if anybody's got feedback about that, about a contractor on behalf of the authority, can you make sure that the service or indeed the convener of uh, the committee is aware so that we can make sure that these are ro robustly investigated? No tenant should be put under duress by any 
by any contractor. That's unacceptable. But at the moment, it's hearsay. Somebody told somebody who told somebody. So if we can cut down the somebody who told somebody's and actually bring that, raise that as a direct issue or complaint, can we do that so that we can get, make sure that this is looked into uh, appropriately, Chair, whether Chair. it be in this service or otherwise? Right. Chair, the department already knows about the comments. Good. I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased to hear that, and I wouldn't like to think that any tenant, you know, had to to go through that process. Uh, and Cameron and I have spoken in, in some detail that there are, no, there are reasons why sometimes people refuse a entry, and that can be to do with their well-being or their mental health. Cameron, would you like to say anything about the training that staff have undergone regarding how they sensitively and appropriately uh, engage uh, with um, our tenants? Yeah, sure. There was actually a really good exercise done, probably in the last eighteen months, given the prevalence or you know the, the impact of the pandemic. So we've been working really closely with social work to make sure there's an awareness of all of our policies around you know adult and child protection, and we make sure that all of our, our uh, all of the staff and my team and the wider service are aware of those policies and the, and the requirements of each member of staff under that. And we also give uh, toolbox talks to our contractors to make them aware. That whilst they're, they're likely to be in the properties in more, most cases more than us, so if they see anything that may you know, trigger a kind of a need for a referral, they're also it's incumbent on them that they can raise that clues and then we take the corrective action in conjunction with social work colleagues. Thanks very much, Cameron. Councillor Goldie. I was happy to hear that it will be a last resort forced entry. I just uh, given the fact that we have high numbers of COVID present within North Lanarkshire just now. Has that taken cognizance in the refusal? Do we get a, a degree of people saying, sorry, I'm COVID positive, can't have access to that? Uh, I just think about the safety of not only the residents, but the staff going in to fit the fire alarms. Um, are we finding that that's one of the reasons for refusals or is there other, I know that you've said mental health issues and various other ones of that. Um, is that taking cognizance of the COVID status of the household at the time when the requests are made? Absolutely, Councillor. Yeah, when we send out the, the appointments requests, we ask if there's a standard form, which we ask if they, when they respond, if anyone's shielding or has had COVID within a defined period. So we're making sure that there's, that there's these markers, these health health markers on any of the, kind of the properties that we attend. In relation to the safety of our own staff and also the contractors, um, we've got risk assessments in place and we make sure that all of our Staff and operatives have got the appropriate PPE in place if they are going in to do, um, you know, works in any of any kind, whether it be for this type or, or anything, that um, all the kind of COVID measures are in place to, to kind of mitigate that. Um, so yeah, we, we've got a lot, of, quite a lot of checks and balances in place. But if somebody's categorically refusing as a direct result of COVID, um, we'll go back at a later date. We, won't, we would never have a force access on it, given the, the sensitivity around that. Got no other comments or questions in the chat bar. Uh, can we approve uh, this uh, report, colleagues? Thank you very much. Uh, can we move on to item 12A, please, um, regarding the approval to the commencement of procurement uh, water quality uh, control? Cameron, is it yourself that's taken this report? Uh, yeah, thanks, Kevina. Um The purpose of this report is just to seek committee approval to commence a new procurement exercise for a measure term a contract for water quality control, um, seeking approval today to commence the procurement of that exercise. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any comments regarding this, colleagues? Seeing nothing in the chat bar. Thank you. Can we approve uh, the commencement of the contract? Yep, thank you very much. 12B is the approval of commencement um, of the procurement of the Bitchman Macadam uh, bitmark repairs. Uh, anything to say on this, Cameron? No, it can be very similar to the last one, just seeking approval from committee today to commence a new procurement exercise for the, the MTC of a bitmark contract. Can we approve that, colleagues? Yep, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item 13, it's the General Debtors Debt Write-Off Report for 2021. Uh, Stephen, can I come to you for this report, please? Hi, Convener. I think Greg's going to pick this one up. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Greg. Okay, Convener. I'm happy to pick it up. Uh, morning, everyone. So this is the annual report to committee uh, to outline the outcome of the services uh, review of its outstanding debtors accounts, um, which have highlighted a number of accounts that are required for, for write-offs. Um, service raises accounts um, across a number of the service areas, including waste collection, 
cleaning uh, property repairs and, and vehicle rentals. And the value of invoices raised um, during 2021 was um, around £32 million. Um, like all services, every effort is made um, in conjunction with the corporate debt recovery team uh, to ensure that we recover any outstanding debts, um, and that includes things like reminding le reminder letters, um, the use of collection agents, and, and ultimately then legal action. However, despite that, uh, there's a number of accounts that are deemed uncollectible for a, for a number of reasons. And in paragraph 2.2, we highlight those reasons, um, including the death of the debtor, or that the balance is uneconomical to pursue. Um, in other words, the cost of pursuing it would, would exceed the cost of the, of the debt that's outstanding. Um, in table 2.3, we're highlighting the, the specific number of accounts for write-off per reason. Um, and we're highlighting that um, there are 1,203 debts, totaling £116,583, uh, sorry, 116,000 pounds, um, 583 um, are under £500 that have been written off through the delegated authority of the Executive Director of Enterprise and Communities and the Section 95 Officer. And the committee is asked to approve the write off of 68 debts, um, totaling just under £166,000 um, for those that are over £500 each. Um, the total value of the write off um, this year is less, continues to be less than 1% of the total accounts raised by the, the service annually. Um, and while that value is higher uh, than in previous years, um, I think we, we can all recognise that given that we've gone through through COVID and some of the debt recovery activities may be falling down the agenda and the wider economic impact um, of COVID, um, that that's not necessarily entirely unreasonable and it's been repeated across other, other service areas. Um, and it's also worth highlighting that given the, the council and that the service made a financial provision for, for this write-off um, in closing the accounts for 2021, um, this report uh, and this write-off doesn't create any additional financial burden for the service. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Greg. Councillor Valentine, can I come to you, please? Thanks, Chair. Just a couple of points. Uh, one for Greg. Uh, on the table, on 2.3, uh, could you just clarify for the committee that the figures there are purely for the debt and not for the council's, you know, various follow-ups and letters and all the rest of that is purely a debt figure and a thank you for 2.5 which we have asked for for a while and you have continually given us this the comparison for the past couple of years uh, is very welcome because it allows members to see what's happening and, and look at trends thanks Yep, no bother, Councillor Valentine. So on uh, table, the table in 2.3, I can confirm that the amounts are just the original debt, um, so no additional costs are added uh, to, to those values. We don't actually capture um, additional costs because it could be a small part of somebody's job doing, doing, doing the debt chase up. It's not a, it's not a specific role that, that somebody would have within a service, um, um, like it would be for things like council tax, where we have specific teams that are, are, are responsible for, for chasing debt. And for, for managing it, so we don't we don't capture that additional cost element, and it's not included in this report. Thank you very much. I don't have any other comments in the the chat bar. Um, can we approve a, a note the recommendations that are outlined in page one hundred and eleven, colleagues? Yep. Thank you very much. Moving on to item fourteen. A, A now is the HRU Revenue Provisional Outturn Report. Greg, can I come to you, please? Thanks, Convener. Uh, so this report is to, takes us to period four, uh, which is up to the 23rd of July uh, 2021. And at this early stage of the financial year, the, the service currently projects uh, a break-even position, although that's likely to change as the, as the year progresses and we get um, access to more and more information. Um, however, there's a few points that are, are worth highlighting to the committee. Uh, firstly, within the, the background section in, in paragraphs 1.2 and 1.3, we're highlighting that the HRA budget monitoring position no longer includes um, income and expenditure in relation to homelessness and temporary accommodation. Um, it's worth, again, it's worth noting that the provision of those services as a general fund function um, and following consultation with the Section 95 officer, those um, income and expenditure budgets are now going to be represented within the Enterprise and Communities non-HRA um, revenue monitoring position. And as a consequence of that decision, the temporary accommodation reserve that was previously presented as part of the HRA balance 
has also been transferred to the general fund, but will be continued to be retained for the same purpose. And, and as a reminder, the purpose of that is to help manage the potential future impacts of, of welfare reform if we get to a situation where um, the Department of Work and Pensions applies the benefit cap and that benefit cap happens to be um, below the, the charges that we currently apply, apply for, for temporary accommodation. Um, so that reserve will continue to, to be there um, to support that, that position if it happens to materialise. Um, as I said, at this stage, there's no significant variances to report. And the good news for the services is that they are projected to achieve 100% of their approved savings during the financial year. Again, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Greg, for that report. Councillor Castles. Thanks, Chair. So just to go back over those areas on page 115 and 116, the on the housing revenue account budget, um, the, the money being taken out of the homeless budget on HRA and moved into the other account, and the same with item is at 1.3, the temporary accommodation being moved into the general fund. Could you just reinforce what the advantages are and will this money be being fenced for the, the original purposes? But what, what are the advantages of moving out of one, one account, the HRA account, and moving it into the general fund? Yeah. So it's more to really comply with legislation. And historically, it probably should never have been in the HRA in the first place because, the, as I said, the, the, the provision of and the function of temporary accommodation and homelessness is a general fund function. Um, so the HRA, and it's always been ring fenced within the HRA. It's never been funded from rents, um, and, and tenants have never have never funded that. It's always been fully funded from income that's received from um, either income from uh, from from people that are in uh, temporary accommodation or from um, from benefits or universal credit. So it's always been ring fenced within the HRA, but it's simply to remove it from um, our HRA position to make the HRA position cleaner, really. Um, but the, the, the full element of income and expenditure will continue to be increased within the general fund and will continue to, to report on it as such um, and manage that se separately. It's just it's in ter terms of making it, um, it's making it easier for us in terms of statutory reporting back to the Scottish Government and some of the statutory returns we've got to do. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. I've got no other questions uh, on this report. Can we approve the questions as? The, the questions, the recommendations as outlined uh, in the report. Thank you very much. If we can move on to the Enterprise and Communities Revenue Monitoring Report at 14B. Greg, that's yourself as well. Yep, thanks, Camille. So again, this report is for period four. And again, at this early stage in the financial year, the service anticipates a break-even position with no significant variances to report at this stage. Um, now, the main reason for that um, break-even position is that the services budgets now reflect the outcome of the Council's COVID recovery budget process, um, which will be presented to um, Policy and, no, sorry, it's Finance and Resources Committee uh, later on this month. That um, process uh, provided additional funding um, to the service to support anticipated costs and loss of income um, of over £11 million during 2021 uh, and in addition um, it included over £3 million of one-off COVID um, investment budgets. Um, and Appendix 7 provides a, a significant amount of detail on the types of impacts facing the service and the costs that are supported by the COVID, uh, COVID recovery budget. The uh, services continues to have a number of cost pressures, um, and they'll, they'll continue to be monitored um, particularly closely uh, during the financial year. And those include the things like the timing of savings delivery, um, additional tonnage in relation to waste services um, that we're still seeing um, following the, 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 the lockdown um, happened, that happened last year and income recoveries linked to school meals. Um, again, the good news, similarly to the HRA report, is that the service expects to achieve 91% uh, of its approved um, savings in the year. Um, and the gap of, I think it's £288,000, um, is linked to timing issues and staff-related savings. And one saving that, um, given the COVID crisis, um, is deemed unachievable at this point in time, and that's the, um, the, the saving related to building cleaning in schools. Um, so management action is in place to, to close the in-year gap uh, for the timing related one, and the medium-term financial plan um, is, is, is going to take care of the, um, the building cleaning issue, um, and that will be a consideration for the uh, Policy and Strategy Committee later on this month. 
so I'm yeah. happy to take any, any questions on that. Thank you very much, colleagues. I'm not seeing any questions uh, in the chat bar um, at, at this time. No. Nope. Uh, can we approve uh, the recommendation? So it's to note the financial position. Colleagues, can we do that now? Thank you very much. Can I come now to item 15AA, is the HRA Capital Monitoring um, Report. Greg, yourself. Thanks again, Convener. So this is the, the, the HRA Mainstream Capital Programme. Uh, we're currently projecting an underspend of around £10 million uh, to the financial year end. And the report highlights that there are a number of external factors giving rise to that outcome. Um, and they're primarily as a result of uh, the impact of COVID-19 um, and potentially even Brexit. But it's difficult to determine exactly wh which, um, which element this has its most significant impact. Um, and particularly um, it, for, for COVID, the ongoing restrictions early in the financial year um, had an impact on um, contractors being able to complete works. Um, and that's continuing over the course of the financial year where um, there are difficulties in the external market due to shortages in, in labour and in raw materials. Uh, the position's not unique. Um, and the, the next report that I'll talk about uh, actually explains that in the general fund capital programme, similar um, issues are being experienced and that will be subject to a report to the Policy and Strategy Committee later on in the month. Um, but the assurance I can give um, and that we have sought from Financial Solutions is that the services um, done a significant amount of work over the course of the current financial year to work with contractors um, and review work profiles in an attempt to accelerate activity where that's been possible. Um, but even after all that work, the position is still at an underspend of £10 million. Um, and those works will continue. Uh, they will happen. It's just that they're going to be reprofiled into future years of the capital programme. Uh, so I can give that assurance to elected members that it's not that, that we're not going to get those works completed, it's just that the timing of them is going to differ. Um, in both the New Build Programme and Open Market Purchase Scheme, we're currently expected them to outturn on target. Um, and largely that's because the budgets have been created to reflect. Uh, we, we did that kind of later point in the financial year. Um, and those budgets have been created um, and, and, and set to reflect anticipated programme delivery. So they're kind of already taken into account. Um, COVID-19 COVID related issues. Um, so at this stage, we're expecting them to, to outturn on target. Again, I'm happy to take any, any questions. Thanks very much, Greg. I don't see any questions. Uh, at this. Oh, sorry, I do. Councillor Goldie. Thanks, Kavina. Just a comment on the effect of Brexit on the, the supply of materials. Have we any indication that there's an increased cost when these materials are available? And will that have an effect? Just said we don't know the true cost of Brexit as yet, but certainly speaking to other people who have tried to obtain materials, even when they are available, the costs have increased substantially. I'm happy to, to answer part of that, but I, I wonder if Cameron can maybe help support that answer. But um, it's a combination of impacts, uh, Councillor Goldie. Um, what we're seeing is, is that following the various lockdown restrictions that we've had over the last 18 months, that um, sort of global supply chains are a bit mixed up and they're a bit messed up that um, things like container shipping ships are, are, are the wrong place and all that kind of stuff. So it's not necessarily linked to Brexit. We're seeing some of these um, supply chain problems happening in, in, in Europe as well. Uh, so to actually pin it down to a specific reason, it's actually been incredibly difficult. And we're actually hearing from some of our suppliers and our contractors that um, the Suez Canal um, issues um, over the, a few months ago are still having an impact because of that, that delay in the, in the time that it's taken. Um, so in terms of increased costs, I do think we are we are seeing them. Um, but in terms of the, the future of that and how long that's going to be sustained, I'm not entirely sure. So I don't know if Cameron's got anything to add on that. Yeah, sure, happy to come on that one. We're, we're actually in the process of engaging with our, our, our contractors and their supply chain um, with the view to them giving us a forecast of what the knock-on implications of kind of the pandemic and Brexit and as Greg mentioned, all other kind of moving parts that kind of contributes to that. So that, that's a that's a process we're going to be implementing in the near future. And um, we're taking it to CMT probably this calendar year with a series of uh, generic questions that we're going to ask of all of our contractors because you know, as you appreciate whilst we live in the world of construction, it's not peculiar to that. So we need to find as a council what is the risk to us can all of our contracts kind of going forward. So yeah, it's a process that we're we're, we're aware of and we're kind of putting uh, the kind of final kind of implementation of phases in, in place and also for us to kind of capture the information from the market. 
Thanks very much for, for that, uh, Willie. I've got no other uh, questions at this time. So can we note uh, the financial position um, and uh, paper 15A? Thank you very much. Uh, if we can move on now to paper 15B, which is the Enterprise and Communities Capital Monitoring Report. Greg, can I come to you, please? Yeah, thanks again, can we up for again this, um, at this stage in the, the financial year um, within the Enterprise and Communities Capital Programme, we're presenting a break-even position, but it's really worth highlighting in paragraph 2.1 that um, we're advising committee that there have been a number of challenges and risks, as we've just discussed, in relation to delivery of the programme. And, and they are some of them are different from the, the, the HRA because of the nature of the works and the nature of the supplies that are required. Um, it often differs, but the, the overall theme uh, is similar, that we're experiencing significant issues in relation to the supply of labour and materials, uh, which have an impact on the ability for the programme to deliver. Um, this Council Strategic Capital Delivery Group met a couple of weeks ago to, this, to consider this. And there will be a report um, going to the Policy and Strategy Committee later in the month um, to seek approval to do a, a, a reprofiling of the Council's capital programme to reflect on the, those challenges that we're experiencing um, and to, to, to make sure that our budgets are, are, are prudent um, and deliverable in the, in the current financial year and reflective of, of what's, what we have the ability to achieve. Um, again, I'm happy to take any, any specific questions on that. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Greg. Any questions, colleagues? I'm not seeing any in the chat bar. I'm sure we're all um, understanding of the, the challenges that it is to, to profile and project um, in, a, in a world of um, moving pieces at the, at the moment. Um, we've got no questions, so can we approve a uh, paper 16B, please, as is outlined in the recommendations? Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to 16A is a contract approval. Um, Cameron, do you have anything to, to say to this report? Thanks, Kirvina. Um, the purpose of this report is to ask committee to approve the award of a measure term contract for water quality control to SPE Limited. Um, the contract is, will be for an initial period from December this year to January 24, with an option to extend for one year. Um, and we're seeking approval to award that contract from committee this morning. Thanks very much, Cameron. Uh, Councillor Valentine. Thanks, Chair. Uh, two points on this. Uh, the first one, and it, it goes to a few of the, these contract ones that we get. Is it possible to include in these uh, reports the previous incumbent of the contract? And the reason for that is, is just for transparency for councillors to see whether we're chopping and changing uh, every contract or whether it's the same contractor that's won the same one again. So that's a, a general inquiry for all uh, this type of contract approval ones. Can we have the previous contractor mentioned within the minute? And my second point, and Robert Steenson will answer this one because he answered that last time and I can't remember the blooming answer. Why do we not have living wage accredited employees as part of the tender process? Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor uh, Valentine. So, a couple of questions there. So, Robert, do you want to? So, we've we'll got Cameron and uh, Robert ready on standby to yeah. respond. Uh, happy to. I, I can answer both and, and I'll let Cameron off the hook for a minute. Um, and, and in terms of your, your, your first point, Councillor Valentine, yes, we, we can put who the previous com uh, incumbent was. We, we can. And, and it's it's not that, that we would chop and change. It's, it's the outcome of the evaluation process. But, but, uh, do you know what? It's, it's, it's not a great difficulty to add that, and then we'll, we'll do that for future reports. In terms of the living wage accredited, living wage accredited is a voluntary scheme, um, and, and through the procurement regulations, um, we, we can insist that they're living wage accredited, and we, we do encourage it, and, and, and we do actually, in terms of um, how we actually score the quality elements of, of uh, tenders, uh, um, it's more favourable for, for those employers who pay um, the living wage. Uh, um, to, to state that they do so because it gives them more quality points. But in terms of the procurement regulations, we cannot insist upon it. Um, we, we obviously, um, they've got um, legal obligations in terms of the minimum wage, which they have to comply with, but uh, um, um, living wage accreditation is voluntary. So so we can't insist on it, but but we do encourage it. And, and it does score more favourably in terms of the qualitative element of the tender evaluation. But in, in terms of the, the overall outcome, it, it cannot be insisted upon um, because of the, the, the legal requirements around about procurement regulations. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate that. 
can we approve the report as outlined in the recommendations, colleagues? Thank you. Uh, moving on to item uh, 16B, um, that will be Cameron for this one, I think. Thanks, Convener. Um, very similar to the last report. Um, the purpose of this report is to seek a, a, a approval from committee to award the MTC for warden calls to sheltered housing, housing complexes. Um, they were proposing that the award is made to La Grande Electric. Um, the contract would be for an initial period of January 22 to January 24, uh, with, an, uh, with an option to extend by a further year. Um, so we're seeking approval this morning for committee to approve that award. Thanks very much, Cameron. Um, I'm, is there any questions, colleagues? I don't see any in the chat bar. No, can we approve uh, the report as is outlined in the recommendations? Thank you very much. Um, we have a new supply programme uh, procurement. Uh, moving on to item 17A. Uh, Pam, can I come to you, please? Thanks, convener. Yeah, so this report's just providing an update to the committee on progress with procurement of the new supply programme. And also, Greg's already um, touched on or outlined some of the, and, and Cameron as well, about some of the issues that we're currently experiencing. Uh, in terms of um, cost increases around um, issues about availability of materials um, and labour. Um, so this report's just outlining um, how we are going to hopefully attempt to, to um, mitigate some of that by using the flexibility that exists within the, um, the frameworks that we use uh, to look at awarding a direct award to contractors who are not necessarily the, the first ranked on the, the framework, but obviously would have, um, so if the first rank doesn't have the capacity um, or not able to, to take on the work, then that gives us flexibility uh, to um, direct award to other contractors, um, obviously subject to um, being able to demonstrate the value for money. So that that's uh, something that we're looking at at the moment in terms of the next batch of um, the, the new build uh, programme. Committee will also be aware, um, because we've spoken about it previously in other reports, about issues, um, ongoing issues with um, Scottish Water and um, being able to um, progress a number of projects. Uh, and one of those was at Community Road in Bells Hill, where we had um, significant issues, which has caused uh, quite quite a lot of delay and uh, cost increases. So we finally um, achieved a solution with uh, Scottish Water, albeit with additional cost. And um, we've agreed a final um, tender price. Uh, and we're seeking a, approval of that um, contract award to CCG um, at the, the cost of £6 million. That includes the contingency allowance. It should be noted, um, however, that Scottish Government have indicated, uh, given um, the, the cost of the, the Scottish Water Solution, that they would consider additional grant um, for these uh, projects, and we have submitted uh, a, a claim or an additional um, request for additional grant for, for this project. Um, happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Pamela. Appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Valentine, you've got a question. Yes, it was something Pamela said there, and it sort of struck me as odd. Uh, did you say that the, it may be that a top tender for a contract may not win that contract? If it can't guarantee its supply chain, is that is that what you said? No. So the the, the frameworks um, that have already been uh, tendered. Um, so so the the frameworks that we use, which are um, Scotland Excel uh, and the SPA framework. So there's a number of um, different lots and different uh, batches. So they, the the contractors that are appointed uh, onto that framework have, have obviously already been. Uh, subject to um, a, a tender process, and, and that's why they, they get onto the uh, to the framework. And the, the terms of the framework allow for direct award um, to any of the contractors on um, on that particular lot uh, for, for whatever the criteria uh, the different criteria are. So we we can go to any contractor on on that um, in that lot, and we would normally obviously go to the first ranked. Um, and give them the opportunity to, to submit their tender for the works. So some, because of the issues currently with uh, capacity in the uh, in the sector, then um, some contractors who obviously are getting a lot of work um, from these through these frameworks may not have the, the capacity to take on the work at 
within the time scales that we're looking for. So it gives us the flexibility um, to go to other contractors on that uh, in that particular lot um, if we so choose, and obviously subject to them um, demonstrating value for money. And for a lot of these uh, contractors, we've already got competitive tender rates from them um, for other projects. So it, it gives us that added uh, check, if you like, in terms of being able to compare rates um, across uh, for, for um, different um, jobs. So that, that would be uh, gives us that added flexibility. Otherwise, obviously, the, there's impact in terms of uh, delay to the programme. Does that give you comfort, uh, Councillor Valentine? Thanks. Um, I've got no other uh, questions. Uh, can we approve the uh, recommendations, uh, colleagues, that are outlined on page 163? Yep. Thank you very much. If we could move on to item uh, 17B. And again, those uh, hawk-eyed amongst you will have noticed that there was a reference to the Policy and Strategy Committee this time, instead of the Housing and Regeneration Committee and the recommendations. Uh, and I've sought clarity on this, colleagues, and it's most certainly within the remit of this um, this committee that we make the, the decisions uh, regarding uh, this. So it is a, a typo and nothing uh, and nothing else. So we are happy to proceed with that in the recommendations. So, so um, Brian, are you taking this or is Cameron? Uh... Sorry, could me I had to go. That, that, that's me back. Yeah, this is the one about the, the, it's the, the... award that it blocks two and three of the heating. There's the one. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brian. And thanks for rejoining us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this, this, this is a new exercise to put in place a new contract for all things heating, gas, renewables and electric and um, carry out a competition in um, lot one. Um, there was a few um, queries about the, the, the tender and how we went about it and um, we brought it back in. The specification um, from the consultant needed a bit more work and um, after there were some queries from the, 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 the bidders. So we decided to withdraw that and redo our, our, our requirements there. So we went ahead and um, awarded the other two lots uh, to keep the the, 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 the wheels on, the, the, the programme, to make sure we kept getting the work done. We've got programmes in place to contain with the gas, and we are going out to uh, the, the market again. Uh, I think it's going to be the next couple of weeks again to, to attract a new uh, bidder for the, the gas element of the, 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 the three lots. So so that's the current position. So Robert... Um, Delegated, homologated the, the award of lots two and three um, to keep the, the programme running. So, um, as I said in the report, we'll, 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 we'll come to another future providing an award for the gas lot. Happy to take any questions. Thanks for that, Brian. Councillor Valentine, you've got a question. No, oh, Brian answered it there uh, during that uh, brief update. And I'd like to point out that uh, Saltire, who won them, are Scottish Living Wage accredited employers. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's which we always like to see. We can't insist upon it, but we always like to see it. Thanks very much. Colleagues, can we approve Report 17B, please? Thank you very much. So let's turn the page. And the final report for today is the is Report 18, and it's contracts awarded below committee approval threshold. That is there for our noting colleagues. Can we note this report? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for your attendance at this morning's uh, committee. You're just into the afternoon, so I hope you have a good day and it looks like the sun is shining. Enjoy. Take care. Bye-bye.